Good evening, everybody. Uh, just give us a second. We'll wait for our attendee room to fill up. Okay, so we're at 42 right now. And it looks like we're leveling off at 42, 43. Okay, uh, so let's come to order. And if uh, could <coughs> join me. Where's my safari? And a salute to the flag. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. The United, United States, States of America. America. The Lord for its stands. One nation under God. God. Indivisible. God. Liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. And could we have a sunshine announcement, please? Okay, and then uh, good evening. Today is Tuesday, November 20th, I mean 24th, 2020. This is a Jersey City Planning Board meeting with a scheduled start date, start time at 5.30 p.m. In an effort to adhere to social distancing protocols and best practices imposed by city and state authorities, the City of Jersey City canceled all public meetings until further notice. As a result, this planning board meeting is being held virtually as a video conference that is open to the public. In accordance with the Open Public Meeting Act, notice of this meeting has been given to the editor of the Jersey Journal, the Jersey City Reporter, and posted with the city clerk on November 20th. This meeting was also posted on the Jersey City Division of City Planning webpage, and all distribution materials made available to the board were published and available to the public. Thank you. All right, could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Vice Chairman Gonzalez? Here. Uh, Commissioner Allen? Here. Uh, Commissioner Gangadin? Here. Commissioner Horton? Here. And Vice Chairman Gonzalez? I mean, Vice, I'm sorry, Chairman Langston? Here. Okay, <laughs> five present. Thank you. Uh, Mike, can you swear in the staff, please? I see Erica, Cameron, Matt, Mallory. That's good enough. You guys swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, do we have any correspondence? I know we have a number of meeting or items carried. Correct. So item number eight, case number P20-070 for 626 Newark Avenue is carried to the December 8th meeting with preservation of notice. Item 10, case number P20-086 for 30-32 Jones Street has been carried to uh, December 8th. Item 11 for P20-096 for 17-23 Perrine Avenue has been carried to December 8th with preservation of notice. Um, item 12 for the review and discussion of amendments to the Sith Avenue Gateway Redevelopment Plan has been carried to a date uncertain. Item 24 for case P20 dash 098 for 415 dash 435 Summit Avenue has been carried to December 8th with preservation of notice. Um, I, uh, 
Item 25, case number P20-094 for 650 Grove Street has also been carried to December 8th with preservation of notice. Okay, thank you. Um, could we bring uh, Gerard up real quick? I think I, I owe Gerard an explanation on why we're carrying Perrine. Promoted him. Okay, Gerard, just yell when you're you're alive. I'm alive. How how are you, Chairman? How are you? I, I apologize. Um, I, I know you noticed for tonight. We just found out this was on about at about four forty five. Oh. Um, yeah, I know it was re sunshine. You know, the agenda was re sunshined on Friday. Um, but you know, we have a couple commissioners that that didn't really review it. We didn't know it was on tonight. So uh, we're gonna have to carry you, I apologize. Okay, I I understand it's unfortunate, but I, I completely respect your decision and okay. we'll be on for the eighth, obviously preservation of notice. Um, Absolutely. Um, Santo, do you wanna, did we preserve notice already? I'm assuming. Oh, I believe, I believe council re-noticed for tonight's hearing. Okay, do we wanna check the notice and preserve it or do we just wanna tackle that on the eighth? So I've already looked at the notice. I know that he re-noticed for tonight. Uh, so council, I have no problem with the notice. The notice will be accepted and carried forward for the uh, December 8th hearing. To anybody that's out there in, in the, uh, the World Wide Web, there'll be no further notice of this application. This is case P20-096, 17-23 Perrine Avenue. Uh, it will be heard at the December 8th meeting and there'll be no further notice. So uh, again, December 8th, that case will be heard and council, uh, just for purposes of the record, we will preserve the notice, but we have your consent to extend time within which to act. Yes, Council, you do. Thank you, Council. All right, thank you, Council. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Have a nice holiday, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. You. Okay, uh, so let's move on to new business. Uh, we're going to call item nine is case P20-120, uh, the address being 24 to 32 Van Ripen Avenue. Good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, if you could promote Paul Freitas as well. Looks very relaxed in his Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> oh no, I didn't see it yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is st still photograph. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, for the record, Charles Harrington of Connell Foley on behalf of the applicant. Um, this, this should be quick. It's uh, the proposal tonight or amendments uh, to this previously approved project, which is also part of that Homestead Place extension. Um, so it was, it was approved already by the board. What we're proposing tonight is similar to what was before the board two weeks ago for 26 Cottage um, to provide uh, EFIS um, material on the facades and then provide for uh, work with the Jersey City mural program uh, to provide a mural on, on those facades. Uh, there's a, the only difference here is that we are also asking for a few additional changes to the building where we're going to remove the pool. Uh, we're um, moving the entrance to the residential uh, and I think there might be one other oh, uh, removal of a building uh, marquee, which uh, uh, Mr. Freitas can briefly take you through. Uh, and then I do have Mr. Colling here. If the board wants to hear from him, I also submitted a principal point statement that uh, sets forth our reasoning consistent with uh, you know prior applications before this board and 26 Cottage. Sure. So, with that said, I, I'll move on to Mr. Freitas um let's uh qualify your notice first 
Oh, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We did receive notice of this application. The notice that I have was for the October meeting when it was originally heard and has been subsequently carried. We've had the opportunity to review it. All does appear to be in order, so we can mark that as A1 for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Paul, you see me? Yes, I do. Thank you. I just, I just want to swear you in, okay? Sure. If you swear any testimony you give tonight, it's going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Paul Freitas, P-A-U-L-F-R-E-I-T as in Thomas, A-S. Thank you. Mr. Freitas, good evening. Uh, we've qualified you in the past. Your license is current tonight? Yes, sir. Okay, you're qualified. Thank you. Okay, Paul, could you take the board through the uh, proposed changes? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Just please let me know if you guys can see it. Uh, can you see the uh, footprint of the building right now? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, originally, I don't know if you can see my cursor down here in the corner. Uh, originally, the entrance to the uh, the residential entrance to the building was on Van Ripen. At this location, uh, due to uh, some mechanical constraints, uh, where we had to include a gas meter uh, off the road roadway, we've uh, changed the location of the uh, entrance, the residential entrance, onto the Homestead Plan Extension, uh, and that's basically highlighted by this red bubble here with the double doors. Above it is a a marquee similar to what was uh, originally proposed. Uh, the only difference being is the original marquee spanned the entire length of Homestead Place and turned the corner and wrapped around Van Ripen. So part of this uh, change is to reduce, uh, change the entrance, the residential entrance to Homestead and to reduce the size of the marquee that was uh, originally planned uh, at this location. Um, the second main component to the changes were uh, originally on this rooftop, there was a, a, a large swing pool in this location. Due to budget constraints, the, the pool has been removed from the plan and it's just uh, substituted with uh, pavers in like and kind uh, to the rest of the recreational rooftop area. And then finally, um, on the north elevation, as uh, Mr. Harrington had mentioned, uh, we're proposing the removal of the uh, metal panels with a uh, EFIS uh, product. It's a stucco, plaster stucco based product, uh, which in turn is, uh, is, is good for uh, painting murals on. Um, I have a, I can, it basically looks like this. You'll notice here also, this is the changes to the elevation, which basically show the removal of the canopy. Um, along the uh, Van Ripen and Homestead elevation with a uh, with the canopy still remaining directly over the residential entrance. I think that's all I've got, unless you have any other questions. And here, here is the second floor plan showing the canopy, the uh, marquee, excuse me. Okay. All right, anybody have any questions for Mr. Freitas? And um, who says this? This is Erica's. Um, Erica, we've um, <clears throat> we've done EFIS a few times here now. Yep. Um, what are the? I, I know we generally ask for certain criteria to to have the EFIS, you know, cut inside rather than outside. Um, can you go over you know the standards that we require? Um, I do require. That you, yes, that was one of the conditions. And I think for a lot of them, the proposals where we haven't allowed it to, it, sorry, to extend the entire facade, just wherever the mural is. Mural is. Um, I'm trying to recall if there is anything else. I think, yeah, just trying to control the potential dust. Uh, er Erica, if I may, um, yeah. another, uh, Another condition that the board considered recently was to net the area so that the, during installation, even if they're cutting indoors during the installation, there's an extra security of them netting the area during installation so that it 
perhaps any sort of be on leaving the site as well. And, and those would be acceptable conditions because we're fully aware of, of the, um, you know, the effects if you're not doing this correctly to the community. Yeah. And I, I might add also that uh, this is all, a, most of this is a trowel on product. So it gets troweled onto a, you know some lathe. So it's the, really the, the amount of cutting that's happening here is is really only based on the insulation that gets applied, and the bulk of that is actually large uh, large uh, panels that get applied to the uh, facade. So uh, in the grand scheme of things, the cutting and the and the kind of uh, stuff that might fly off is very limited. Okay. Yeah, we just want to make extra certain that it's you know. Couldn't agree with you more. Careful. Yep. Um, is there a, a certification for EFIS? I, I don't know what to call them. Uh, EFIS installers. Absolutely. Every uh, every installer has to be um, approved by the manufacturer that provides the uh, warranty on the product. So uh, it's a very strict uh, method of operation and installation that has to be followed in order to maintain that warranty. So they're all qualified uh, to do you know the work that that's going to be done here. And okay. I, I believe most, if not all, lenders require that as well when you use this uh, product. Okay. Um, so, Council, can we put that in your um, in your list as well? Sure. And what does that fall under? Carpentry, or is that a, a masonry? It's a masonry product. Um, the EFIS of, of yesteryear was uh, a real uh, terrible product, which was sprayed yeah. on, and it was like uh, styrofoam. That's no longer what's being used, uh, and that and that's why EFIS has got a bad name because that that original product was uh, it had uh, a number of issues with respect to uh, keeping the weather out and degrading over time. Um, this product is is a plaster based product that actually is more of a masonry based product that's uh, you know dries up and it makes a pretty hard shell. Yeah, I've, I've seen the you know the newer in I've seen the older ones and the newer installs of it, and it, it is a a much better product than it used to be. Um, you know, I think it's something that we should be looking at as, as a better insulator than, uh, other products that are out there now. So I don't know, time will tell. Um, okay. Anybody else, any questions? Okay. Council, um, well, the only variance is the EFIS, correct? I'm sorry. The only variance is the EFIS. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. I, as much as I love to hear Mr. Colling, I don't know if we need him tonight. Yes, then we'll, we'll just uh, submit on, you know, our past representations and the principal point statement that I submitted to uh, with the application. Okay, thank you. All right, so at this time, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody's out there that wants to comment, please raise your hand. Uh, if you are calling in, I don't think I see any call-ins, but if you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody from public want to comment? Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Erica, do you want to wrap us up, please? Sure, yes. Uh, so um, I um, submitted a staff report dated October. Uh, we actually do have a, uh, we have a hand. Oh, a hand raise? Yeah. Are we going to open the public back up? Yeah, we should. We should. There's... Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to open public once again. Back in. All right, thank you guys. Public is open again. Uh, we have Mr. Gadsden with his hand raised. I just promoted Gadsden. Okay. I'm sorry, I just had a, just a quick question. Just Wait, real quick, public... before, uh, before you get going, uh, well, are you just asking a procedural question right now? Procedural question, was the public um, speaking open just for that particular issue or you're going to open up public speaking on each various item that you uh, present tonight. Each and every item we uh, we open public up for, Chris. Okay, I'm sorry for an interruption. Sorry. No problem. And that's a great picture on your uh, your screen there. Thank you. <laughs> you you have something to do with it. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to uh, close public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded again. Public is closed. Okay, Erica, wrap us up. Uh, so I provided a staff report dated October 27th to the uh, to Chuck Harrington, and I just want to see if those conditions are fun. They are, yes. So, um, yeah, I don't have any further comments. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P20-120 as presented to the board tonight. Second. Okay. Motion is made and seconded for approval. Okay. With the conditions for the- Yes, uh, the conditions. Okay. Um, Commissioner Allen? Aye. Commissioner Horton? Aye. Commissioner Gingadin? Aye. Vice Chairman Gonzalez? Aye. And Chairman Langston? Aye. The motion carries, all in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Council. All right, let's move to item number 13 is case P20-074. is a preliminary and final major site plan for 756 Communipaw Avenue. Stephen Joseph out there? Yes, I promoted him. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. All right. Uh, actually, you're a little muffled. Am I? I'm using a new uh, new web camera. Oh, boy. No, we can't hear anything. Can't hear anything. Can't hear anything. Is that better? No. <laughs> I think you Mr. Have, Lewis might need to move uh, well too. Steven, you may want to toggle to your microphone. You can click in the top right, uh, that little arrow up, and then maybe say same as system. And that might pull from your laptop microphone. Is that better? No, that was about the same. Okay, one more time. Is that better? That is beautiful. Okay. I am so sorry. No problem. No problem. Okay. Stephen Joseph of the Trami Law Firm for the applicant. Uh, this is 756 Communipaw Avenue. It's actually 756 to 758. It's it's three lots on Communipaw Avenue. Um, it's located mid-block between JFK and, and West Side in the Commercial Automotive District. The applicant is proposing to rehab and reuse an existing one-story car wash and create a laundromat on this site. Um, the proposal includes on-site improvements, including 13 parking spaces, where 12 are required, several street trees uh, filling in of a depressed curb. Um, the use is permitted. We're requesting no variances this evening. This is just a, a major site plan application. So I have one witness for you this evening, Jeff Lewis. He is our licensed architect. Okay, thank you. And Chairman, this was a notice case. It was originally noticed for the November 10th meeting. It was carried to tonight with the preservation of notice. I have reviewed the notice. All does appear to be in order. So we can go ahead and mark that as A1 for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Jeff, I'll swear you in, all right? You swear any testimony you give tonight is gonna to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? We lost your audio. I heard you before, but now I can't hear you anymore. You're muted, Mr. Lewis. There we go. There you go. Well, no. it was there for a second and now it's not. You did something and we can hear you, but now, how about now? Okay. There we okay. go. All right, there we go. Yeah, let me just wait yeah, one I more time. To my okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry. You're wearing your testimony, you're going to give tonight's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And just for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Uh, Jeffrey Lewis, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-E-W-I-S. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I guess for the record, my license is uh, current and in good standing. And so uh, with that, right. I'll just... I was muted. Sorry. I was asking you that question, but yeah, thank you. You're qualified. You shouldn't need to ask at this point. <laughs> um, 
Let me go right to my screen sharing here. Uh, hold on. Oh, I'm losing my mind. Share. Okay, here we go, everyone. So I'm showing you the title sheet of uh, our project for 756 Communipal Avenue, which, as was mentioned, is a new laundromat in the existing one-story brick building. Uh, and we're also having 13 parking spaces, and we're in the CA zone. Uh, and we are not asking for any variances to this project. However, I do want to make one correction on the uh, table before I go, go ahead, uh, and it's in, re in uh, relation to lot coverage. Uh, what it says on the table is actually incorrect. We're actually decreasing the lot coverage on this site. Uh, so the existing lot coverage should read 91.2%, so over the allowed 90%. And then our proposed uh, will be 88.9%, which is actually a little bit below. So we're increasing the lot coverage and bringing it a little bit below the uh, required 90% lot coverage number. And just, uh, I'll jump into this second site plan very briefly, very quickly to uh, let you know what we're doing, how that happened. So and, uh, Mr. the existing Lewis, building has, um, yes, sir. If we could, uh, for uh, the signature plans, can we have that updated? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't. The, for the for the yeah. signature sets, we'll, we'll make the, that correction along with the, um, the corrections that Jeff is going oh. to put out. For the engineering comments as well. Now, are the the corrections on the um, the slide you're showing now? No, these are not corrected. Okay, uh, Santo, do you want to? Uh, obviously, you know this isn't a new exhibit. Uh, do we need to mark anything, being that there's a change? We can. We're going to have it updated for the signature plan. The change is reflected on this plan, Mr. Lewis? No, sir. The change is not reflected on the plan yet. No, it is not. All right, so then we don't need to mark this, but we do need to have that change made, obviously, on the signature plan. Of course, and I should note that it doesn't create an existing variance. It actually takes an existing nonconformity and brings it into conformity with the zoning ordinance. Yeah, so just just for clarity that there's an error in the calculation of the existing lot coverage of the property. Um, that's that's more the existing condition is more than what's reflected on the plans, but the proposed condition is is accurate and remains accurate. Okay. So what is shown on the plan versus what is actually there? Let me, let me, I'm going to walk through this site plan okay. right now. And what I'll show you is I'll talk about what's actually existing now and then what we're adding to reduce that number. Okay. Okay. That works. Okay. Great. Okay. So uh, you can see on the left at these, in these photographs, uh, there's a retaining wall in the back of our property. It actually comes along the side as well on the uh, plan itself. You can see it all the way along this side and all the way along the back. And that's about a five or six foot high retaining wall. And everything on top of that retaining wall between that and the property line is just planted in lawn area and that's on the side and the back. And that's what's existing now as impervious coverage. And that's the only thing that's existing as impervious coverage. We're keeping that and adding uh, these two planting areas in the, uh, in the parking area. So that's what we're adding. That's what's bringing us down to below 90%. Uh, so I wanted to explain that first. And then secondly, I want to explain what we're changing in regards to our engineering comment letter, because I know some of these questions are going to come up, so we might as well address them now. Um, engineering is asking us to provide a new curb for the entire site, new sidewalk for the entire site. And also in regards to that, we're going to eliminate both of the existing depressed curb cuts and present, present only one new curb cut, and that's the 12-foot curb cut where it's shown right now. So that 12-foot curb cut that accesses the driveway is shown properly. However, the long curb cut in front of our building will be removed. Um, that's the second change that we're going to be making. So in regards then, that's uh, from our engineering comments, which were dated 11-9, just for the record. Uh, so new sidewalk, new curb, two new street trees. Um, then moving ice? on to our property, ice. moving on to our property itself, we have an existing uh, concrete paved area in front of the building. 
which we are going to keep. There's a Bilco door into a small basement. Uh, we're going to keep it, but we're going to eliminate and replace the Bilco door with a new Bilco door, which will be painted the same color as the building itself. Uh, we're adding a few benches to the area. We're removing an existing freestanding sign, which you can also see on the street view photo here, is a freestanding sign for the old car wash. So we will be removing that. And then we'll be replacing what was um, these two garage doors with a building entry with an automatic uh, entrance and a second uh, curtain wall uh, window opening. Uh, go, moving on to the driveway garage, uh, garage parking area itself, uh, we are keeping the existing metal uh, gate and fence that's around the front and the side here. Uh, we will be painting that black. It doesn't need any repair. It's in pretty good shape. And then as far as the parking area itself, we are going to be repaving the entire area. As I mentioned, we're taking out these two small sections to add some planting and also add a street tree into the parking area, uh, which gives us 13 parking spaces, including one handicap space, and then also two uh, trash area with two dumpsters in the back. Uh, the handicap space in the back might seem a little strange. However, the last thing I wanna mention on this plan is that there is a second what was a uh, garage door in the back here that we're, keep, we're proposing to use as a second entrance to the building. So people that are parking, including the handicapped spot, will have a very close entrance to the building right here. Uh, and actually, there's one last thing I needed to mention, which is this area that is above that I mentioned in the very beginning. We will keep it planted and replant what, what it needs to be planted. And we will be doing a new uh, six-foot board on board fence along both of these property lines because there's no fence there now. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to our floor plans. And I'm going to go right to the, the proposed first floor plan. This is right here. I could have just zoomed out. Okay, so I want to start here at the front where is our building entry, the main entry. You enter into this uh, large open area, which is for uh, seating. Following this down the left, you have uh, an office with a door out to the outside and another a little private bath attached to uh, an attendant room. After that, uh, there is that second entry that I mentioned from the garage, I mean, from the parking area, and then another door, which is actually just serving as an emergency exit. And then at the very back of the building, we have two ADA bathrooms. Uh, through the center of the building, these main two blocks are blocks of washing machines. Uh, this large open area is a folding area with uh, tables in the middle. And then along the rear and the side of the building, where these are where the dryers are located with a walkway behind them so that uh, attendants can access uh, them from the rear. Uh, and then this little front area, we have an elevated, uh, elevated waiting area. You can see on the top left here, we have a photograph of that pit. It's about a five foot deep pit and that's our basement. So we're gonna build this up a couple of feet so that we have a basement that has a seven foot ceiling height and that'll allow us to put all our meters and utilities in the basement. And then this will be an elevated seating area for, you know, for people that are hanging out doing their laundry. Um, next, I wanna briefly go to the roof plan just to show you uh, this roof actually as part of the um, sale of the building was replaced with a new EPDM roof. So there's a brand new roof on the building. We're proposed, proposing three new rooftop HVAC units. Uh, and because we have a pretty large power pit in the front of the building, you won't be able to see these units uh, from the street. And then the third thing that I wanted to note that we're making clear on this plan is that uh, there's a line uh, 10 feet from the property line and all of our dryer exhaust, all of our exhaust period will be 10 feet away from the property line. This is just noting that just to make sure it's, uh, it's clear. Okay, now looking at the elevations. Uh, this, this top elevation is the side facing the parking garage. And the center elevation here is the front elevation. Um, both there's two signs, one on the side, one on the front, and we're showing uh, a detail, a little blow up of each sign. They're both backlit and they're sized uh, to meet the requirements of the Jersey City signage ordinance. Um, we are replacing one, two, three garage doors. Two of them are being replaced with uh, entry, uh, automated entry doors. The, the third is just uh, a storefront glass uh, window. And then we are adding two new windows to the front of the building as well. Uh, as far as finishes, 
Uh, it's a stucco finish for the building. Uh, and the color is going to be uh, kind of a medium gray color, a little dark. Um, and then the trim itself is also going to be stucco for doors and windows, and that will be a light gray color. And uh, lastly, all of our doors, all of our storefronts, and all of our new windows are anodized aluminum finish for the, for the windows. And uh, this is actually, that concludes my presentation of the architectural drawings, and I could answer questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, sure. I didn't hear you mention it, but um, you know, you have the, the handicapped entrance along the side of the building toward the back. Uh, both entrances are ADA compatible? Yes, they are. Okay. And um, uh, the signage uh, you mentioned is backlit. And actually, Council, this is more for you. Um, could we have a condition that that signage is only lit during operating hours? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I can confirm with my client what the operating hours are. This is a laundromat. Um, I know many laundromats are, you know, 24 hours, large parts of the day. Um, I, I can certainly get confirmation from my client by the time you're done asking questions um, to Jeff. Well, that was my last question. So I hope the board has more questions, but uh, okay. Anybody else, any questions? Yes, I just have one question, simple question. Go ahead, Jeff. Sure. Uh, the vent dryers, oh, good, good, good evening, by the way. The vent, the vent, the dryer vent, excuse me. Mm -hmm. those, they're on a roof, correct? They vent to the roof, that is correct, yes. Okay, so, uh, cause it looked like if you, I think you went back, can you go two pitches forward? Well, you want to go to the roof plan? Yes. It might have been the, the one. Right. Well, this is, so this is the roof plan. What I'm trying to show is this 10 foot area here where no dryer vents will be allowed to be. Okay, no, no. So because, they're all going to have. Okay, no, because at first I looked at it, it looked like it was shooting towards the street, but I, I see it's, it's, it's going uh, vertically, vertically into the air, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Maybe, maybe I looked at the picture wrong. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. I know. What, I'm sorry. I know what you're looking at. If I can just, uh, most of these vents will have a gooseneck at the top, just so water doesn't get into them. So that might have looked like it was shooting out, but it's just a gooseneck. Okay. All right. Then, then you answered my question. I was going to ask you why he's shooting out like that, but okay. Okay. Uh, and I, I okay. do have a, a response from my client. Um, He's more than happy to keep uh, the sign lit only during hours of operation. He doesn't know what hours of operation are going to be. It's going to be the, the maximum extent permitted under the local law. Um, okay. Okay, that works. Anybody else, any questions? One quick question, uh, evening gentlemen. Okay. Uh, I know it was previously a car wash. Was there any environmental testing that needed to be done on the soil or would there be any need for it if there's any contamination or anything like that? I didn't do the closing for my client on this. That's typically part of a closing. He recently purchased it. Um, I, I imagine he did a tank sweep. Um, there were no, there were no environmental issues um, that my client raised to me. Um, and I, I also believe laundry mats have to be licensed. So I, I imagine that's also part of that that application. Yeah, I just want to make sure I know. Sometimes with car washes, there have been issues in the past with. You know, soil being contaminated by grease or oils or heavy metals. I just want to make mm -hmm. sure we're necessarily capping that. If it needs to be remediated, it will be. Understood. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? All right. Thank you, Council. That's your presentation. That that concludes our presentation this evening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is anybody from the public here that wants to comment? I see one hand raised. Let him promote Jake. And once again, if you're uh, here for the public and you want to comment, please raise your hand. If you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Jake, you can come off mute whenever you want. There we go. You guys hear me? I can hear you. Are you able to turn your video on? Uh, trying to start video. Great. I think uh, something happened. 
start my video. Okay. Uh, it was working. Oh, there we go. Uh, there we go. All right. See me now? No. Uh, yeah. There uh, we, we go. go. All okay. right. Can you see me? Hello. Yes, I see you. Okay. I just want to swear you in, okay? Yes, sir. Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Yes, my name is Jake Gerges. First name, J-A-K-E. Last name, Gerges, G-E-R-G-U-E-S. Okay, Mr. Gerges, uh, we have five minutes for you. Okay. Um, has there been a traffic study uh, done for this site, um, just using simple math, if he has 13 parking spots approximately, uh, being that it's a fairly large facility with a um, uh, quick count when they're reviewing the plans, 50 to 60 washers. Um, the, me, I'm a Jersey City resident. I'm on the West Side, West Side Ave Special Improvement District. And we have a crucial issue with traffic, especially on that part of Communal Paul Avenue from, from Kennedy Boulevard crossing over to west side and then so forth going towards uh 19440 um you know just based upon basic math you could have a potentially of up to 150 something cars um that could uh, between 100 to 125 actually um that could impede traffic being that it's a one-way street going both directions um ha has this been looked at in terms of uh impairment of traffic um, just my, my, my point is here, is, is this too much of a big facility on this section of Communal Paul um, Avenue to ac accommodate such a um, uh, operation? Okay. Uh, do you have any other questions? I, I yes. like to list everybody's questions. Oh, oh, oh one shot. Okay, not a yeah, problem. Put on one shot. Uh, two, uh, my father's been in Jersey City since 19... Um, 64, and before it was a car wash, it was a mechanic shop. And um, based upon the photos that I see on the plans here, um, you know, I'd like to see if the board would consider possibly looking into the environmental issues as opposed, you know, being that Communal Paul Avenue is a long stream of mechanic shops and automotive and industrial use, uses, um, you know, as part of the improvement in the area, I'd like to see that, you know, if there is some sort of uh, contamination that it to be remediated and uh, cleaned up. Um, the other part I had was um, if in the area, um, I'm with a lot of residences and um, there's quite a few laundry facilities in the area and under a mile, actually under eighth of a mile, you have a total of uh, 200, over 265 washers within the area. And I, I don't know if being that if this is going to cause such a traffic uh, concern and, and uh, parking issue as well, because um, 60 washers, you can have, let's say it's two people to a washer, you could have as many as 30 people, but if not more at a given time in that facility. So, part, you know, if you look in the plans, you even see people parking in front of the driveway of the building. Um, and, all, and all over. I mean, if you all, I'm sure everyone knows Communal Paw very well, and we know that it's, it's quite a bit of a cluster over there. So um, I'm just concerned that some of that traffic might just in on a West Side Avenue. And as we all know, West Side Avenue uh, is, has a huge deficiency of parking and traffic, uh, traffic flow as it is already. So um, my concern is that um, it, it might disrupt people within the area commuting, driving, um, as it already has. Um, already. Um, but yes, as I said, there's 200 and something washers that's already under a mile within the area. I, I don't know if maybe this use um, would be a little redundant to what the community would need. Um, as you know, it'd be one thing if you see, you know, if the, all the seven or eight laundromats within under a mile would have a line out the door, in which case they don't, um, based upon the air, you know, me being in the area. Um, uh, also with the laundry, uh, I don't, have they received a clearance from JCMUA in regards to this laundry facility, not interfering with sewer, um, as Communal Paul Avenue, um, has currently a very bad sewer, which also connects into Westside Avenue and also with the fresh water demand, um, our, our residences 
going to uh, be affected by the demand of this facility, um, or you know, uh, requiring such utilities within the area. Um, the other part was it in terms of venting. Um, I don't see a specific venting detail. I know the architect said that it's 10 feet away, but you know, uh, is the gooseneck going to be facing towards the, the windows that are next to the, the house that's immediately sharing uh, the same retaining wall? Um, there is a window that is level to where that roof is, actually two windows, two to three windows, I do believe, if memory serves me right, looking at Google Earth. Um, you know, even though it's gooseneck and it's 10 feet away, the the um, the exhaust emission, you know, could still get to the window without a problem. Um, and I'm going to assume that it's a, uh, are they going to be individually vented or is it going to be in a manifold type style like you have, you know, with your boilers and multifamily units, it's, it's in a, a manifold that goes right out to a chimney. Um, are these things going to be aff affected by the residences that are living in the two family home to the right and also the residents to the left? Um, that's your five minutes, sir. Uh, yep. But we'll, we'll get everything answered for you. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Thank uh, you. I have, I have one question for the witness before we, we take them offline. Uh, Mr. Gurgis, do, do you own any laundry mats in the area? Uh, my father does. Your father does. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Council, um, if we could, let's uh, address these. Actually, there's one that I think uh, the board should address or planning should address. Um, as far as, you know, having too many laundry services in the area, it, it's a permitted use. Uh, the board really doesn't have jurisdiction over how many laundromats can open in an area. Um, as long as it's a permitted use, you know, we'll let the, uh, the chips fall and, and, you know, let the economy take care of it, whether it's, it's necessary or not. Uh, Council, do you agree with that, that assessment? I 100% agree with that assessment. Okay, uh, and if we could, let's um, let's address the traffic study, um, the environmental issue we've touched on, but maybe expand on it. And I do know that um, in the engineering department's comments, uh, item number two on their comments are uh, to provide an engineer's report to analyze water and sewer. Yeah. So. Um, Number one, the, the environmental, I, I did speak with my client just now. He did do a tank sweep. There was no tank found at the property when he purchased. Um, the traffic impact study, I requested a waiver as part of my application. The application was deemed complete. We're here before you this evening. Um, the, so the MUA, my client has been working with the MUA for some time. Um, we're actually at the point right now where my client's application to the MUA is going to expire um, if we don't get approved tonight and they're going to have to renew it. So they, they've been in communication with the MUA for a significant period of time regarding water. They've also been uh, electrical is also a, an issue for laundry mats. They've, they've discussed uh, with the appropriate authorities how this facility is going to be powered, where they're going to draw that power from. So that that's all being being taken care of, um, and there are there are communications between um, the the applicant and, and those agencies. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if I missed anything in there. That's not a, uh, not a concern. That was everything we had. That was the thing I had for you. Okay, so let's move on with public. Uh, anybody else from public? If you could raise your hand. If you are calling in, you can please press star nine to raise your hand. Once again, anybody from public, please raise your hand. If you're calling, press star nine. You know, hands raised. Okay, I'll entertain a uh, motion to close public. Should Chair, seeing no more public, I, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public's closed. Okay, Cameron. Okay, um, so firstly, to add on to some of the public's comments, um, I just looked at the NJDEP's known contaminated sites list, 
And this site is not currently identified as a contaminated site by the state of New Jersey. Um, but either way, that's not something that actually we would, through this board, have control and ask for um, an assessment prior to issuing a pro approval or denial. But um, anyway, so firstly, I'm just gonna ask that the applicant agree to the staff memos conditions listed in the memo dated November 6th of 2020. The applicant agrees to those conditions. The applicant agrees to the conditions in the engineering comments. Um, in, in, a, in addition to those conditions, we're agreeing to correct, correct the error in the existing lot coverage calculation on the final signature plans. We're agreeing to make the engineering comments on the final signature plans. And uh, I'm, I'm sure council is going to add the condition that we merge these lots by deed um, since it's multiple lots, it also as a condition of approval. And there is also the condition that the signage remains illuminated only during the hours of operation. I but um, well. yeah, so we're going to add that to the resolution and correct the signature sets. But, um, you know, only other thing to add is that the applicant worked closely with the city forester on remedying some of the landscaping issues. Um, this corridor is a commercial corridor that permits retail uses um, up and down it. There are quite a redundancy in uses and that's also something that staff and planning raised as a question to the applicant, but, you know, this is capitalism. Um, and with that, this meets the objectives and goals of the redevelopment plan. Uh, the planning department sees it a fitting use and recommends approval. Okay, thanks, Cameron. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P20-074 as presented to the board tonight. Okay, okay motion is made and seconded for approval. Okay. Okay, Vice Chair Gonzalez. Aye. Okay. Um, Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Okay. Commissioner Jeffrey Allen. Aye. All right. Um, I don't know why I lost. Our commissioners here. Well, hold on with me. We're up to Commissioner Horton. Commissioner Horton's and I. Okay. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Horton, thank you very much. Yeah, I was in a new view setting. Um, and help me here, Chairman. Who's next? Uh, that would be me, Lieutenant. Oh, there we go. Nice. And Chairman Langston. <laughs> uh, that's an I. Okay. Motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's call case uh, item 14 is case P20-104. It's a minor site plan for 145 Bergen Avenue. Ms. Tomlin here. Or Hello. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Uh, so we've got Jeff Lewis here already, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so I'm, uh, my name is Patrick Conlin. I'm an attorney at Connell Foley on behalf of the applicant, 145 Bergen LLC. Um, the property here is 145 Bergen Avenue. Um, it's a 4,696 square foot lot. We're seeking minor site plan approval for a detached four family building. Uh, there's about 9,804 square feet. So this is a minor site plan. We are not seeking any variances, but we did notice for this. Um, and I believe that uh, council should have that. 
We noticed for the November 10th meeting and it was carried. Thank you, Council. Chairman, I am in receipt of the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the application. It was noticed for the November 10th meeting and carried to this evening's meeting with preservation of notice. All does appear to be in order. We can mark that as A1 for the record. Thank you, Council. Great. Okay. So um, detached four family dwellings are permitted on lots of this size in the R3 zone. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our architect, Jeff Lewis. And just for the record, Hello again. So, uh, has been sworn and qualified and remains under oath tonight. All right, Great. Jeff, can you take us through? Okay. Great, okay, I'm gonna start by sharing my drawings. All right. So we're looking at 145 Bergen Avenue, we're proposing a new four story, four family residential building. Uh, we're located on Bergen Avenue. You can see us here. We're actually a block away from the university. Uh, we are in the R3 zone and we are not requiring uh, any variances for this project. I'm gonna move right to the site plan and walk through this a little bit. Um, so we're proposing new concrete curb, new concrete sidewalk and one new street tree in front of the building. Uh, moving on to our property, we're proposing a new lawn in the center of the property, which would be 260 square feet with concrete pavers on each side. Uh, on the right side, that's going to uh, the main entry to the building. And on the left side, it's going to the alley that goes towards the back of the building. Uh, going on each side, we have alleys that are um, concrete walkways with a six foot vinyl fence along the sides and along the rear of the property. And then looking into the backyard of the property, we have a 682 square foot lawn area and a 261 square foot uh, stone patio area. And this area is for the ground level unit. Um, let me, and I'm gonna move on to the floor plans and help explain this a little bit. So what we have is a walkout basement here. So we're three stories in the front, four stories in the back. So this first floor plan, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to make it a little easier to see. This first floor plan that we're calling the ground level plan is, um, is at grade at the back and then at the front here is, is a basement. So you access this unit through from this walkway down the stairs and then there's one door first that goes to the actual basement and in this basement we have uh, four storage spaces, one for each unit and then our sprinkler room because this is a fully sprinkler building and all of our meter rooms. Uh, going, uh, continuing down this walkway, you come through the main entry to this uh, apartment. And so what we have with this apartment is a um, ground level unit that is four bedrooms, four baths, 1,586 square feet. And so you enter, enter the apartment into an open kitchen uh, dining living room area, which also has a coat closet and a washer dryer off of it. And then uh, besides that, we have four ensuite uh, bedrooms to the left to the right. Uh, each of them has a walk-in closet, its own bathroom, and its own uh, linen closet. And then as mentioned before, there's the terrace, I mean the patio and lawn area in the rear, which is also accessed uh, from the walkway for this unit. Looking at the ground, the first floor unit, which is at ground level at the front of the building, uh, we enter the building down here at the bottom. Uh, and then we have a lobby that leads to the main stair and entry to the first floor unit. Uh, this first floor unit is our ADA adaptable unit. Um, and it is a total of 2,018 square feet. And it is uh, designed similar to the other unit, only larger. So we have an open kitchen, living, dining area, and then a, sec and a second eating area that actually has a small balcony off of this. So we're trying to get each of these units their own outside space. Uh, so we have the balcony off of this unit, also a half bath, washer dryer, uh, ducted uh, furnace, because we are doing uh, ducted heat and air conditioning for all of these units. And then again, at the front and the back, each have, there's four total, two in the front, two in the back of ensuite bedrooms with uh, walk-in closets and their own bathrooms, same as before. Going down to the second floor plan, it's a similar plan. Uh, however, it is a larger, it is still four and a half uh, bathroom, four bedroom plan. It's larger because we're losing, we don't have to worry about the, the um, entry lobby here, the entry uh, hallway. So 
So we're gaining space there. We are a total of 2,178 square feet on this floor. Uh, and what we did to use that space better is we made the bedroom bigger, the walk-in closet and bathroom work a little better. And we have a new utility closet for the washer dryer and uh, utilities, which makes our open space uh, for the living room a little bit larger. Moving up to the third floor, we once again have the same as the floor below, the second floor, with one exception. Uh, we are moving uh, this uh, doorway a little forward so that the stair which continues up to the roof is actually inside the third floor unit. So the third floor unit will have their private balcony like, like the second floor and first floor unit have, but then also looking at the roof plan, have the stair going up to the roof and have access to this uh, new roof deck, which is a 460 square foot roof deck. Uh, besides the roof deck on the front and the back of the building, uh, it's just a flat roof with uh, our rooftop condensers on the rear section. Scrolling down to the building elevations. I'm showing the front and the rear here. So as you can see, three stories in the front, and then you get that fourth story uh, back here in the rear. Uh, and uh, the building materials we're proposing are the main material is a uh, brown red brick with a smooth finish. Uh, the two bays here are uh, light warm gray hardy panels. And then all of our windows are uh, composite uh, windows uh, that are black frames with black frame windows. Um, the entry door is a dark gray modern entry door with a glass panel. And um, then moving, looking at the rear, we have the same windows, uh, except uh, as far as this, the building finish, we're using a gray vinyl siding uh, and then a stucco finish on the bottom uh, base here. Then switching to the sides, Uh, you can see the balconies on the side here. Uh, we're doing again gray stucco, I mean gray stucco at the base, uh, gray vinyl siding uh, above. And um, then the last side is the same again. And what you can see here, you can understand the stair coming down. This is the basement door. And then this is the entry door to the ground level apartment, which is also that same uh, modern front entry door that we have on the, the main building entry. Um, and so that's, um, that's my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Hey, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, there are just two quick questions, I think. Um, there's condenser units on the roof? That's right, yes. Okay, so there's no PTAC units or anything like that in the-, in the No, building. no, no, this is, we have furnaces in the unit, uh, ducted heat and air conditioning uh, with four condensers on the roof, one for each unit. Okay, excellent. Um, the only other question I have is if you could um, go over the, the waterproofing on the, the bulkhead stair. Uh, I'm, I, I think I'm correct to say that there's, there's no doorway in the top floor apartment, correct? That, um, that leads to the roof, that's just an open staircase? Open, no, 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 There's no open staircase. This stair here, you can see, um, I think you can see it on the front elevation. This stair is enclosed and it has vinyl siding on no, all. No, on I, all uh, no, I understand that, that it's a, you know, there's a bulkhead on the roof for the stair. Um, but yeah, there's, no right here. Door, there's no door from the third floor uh, apartment going up to that stair, correct? Well, what, yeah, what we did is if you look at the second floor, the door is here to get yeah. into the apartment. And what we did is we moved that door to be at the center of the stair here. So you come to this landing, enter into the apartment, and if you want to, you can keep going up, and that's actually inside the apartment. So it's separated from the stair below. So my question is, um, you know, how do you prevent water from coming in that stair bulkhead door up on the roof? This right here? Yeah. Um, Generally, uh, what will this doesn't have to be handicap accessible. So the first thing I like to do is just give this like an eight inch threshold, like height height wise. So it doesn't it doesn't have to actually be at grade. So you keep that a little higher. So water is not going to be boring in. And then obviously pitching everything not towards it is helpful. Okay. Yeah, that answers my question. That's fine. Um, anybody else? Any questions? I just have one. Go ahead, Jeffrey. 
Sure. Uh, I, I see the numbers for the setback on the right side with the balcony. I just can't uh, read them. Could you tell me what they are in between the two buildings, the right side with the balcony? The space between the buildings? Yes. Sure. Let me go. To, I'll go to the site plan and make sure I give you the exact right numbers. I believe it's three feet and two feet, but I want to give you the exact numbers to be sure. Is it really not dimensioned here? I'm sorry, I thought I had the dimension right on here and I don't see it now. I do have it listed in the zone. Oh, here we go, here we go. It's, it's uh, three, foot, three foot one on the right-hand side and actually a little more, it looks like it's uh, a little more than four feet on the left-hand side. Okay, and, and the balconies aren't facing in any windows of the building. No, actually, this is actually helpful yeah. that I came here because you can see the this okay, building I see it now. right I here see it. and this is where the balconies are. Okay, I, so I couldn't see it. Open air. Okay. Yeah, no, you. I didn't show it. It's my fault. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Any questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Council, anything else from you? That's all. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, at this time, we will open it up for public. Is anybody here from the public that wants to comment? If you could, please raise your hand if you want to speak. Uh, if you are calling in, press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody at all from public? Mr. Please. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Um, whose application is this? Cameron. This Cameron's again. Okay, Cameron, do you have any uh, comments? Um, first, usual asking that the applicant agree on the record to conform with all of the staff conditions stated in our report from November 18, 2020. Yes. All right. Um, and as the board may or may not have recognized, this is actually a previous application that came to us, which originally was um, a subdivision which in essence could have created two lots with two of these buildings on it. Um, and now what we have in front of us is a fully conforming project with very spacious, spacious units, um, which we like to see, which is you know more diversity in our housing market in Jersey City. Um, and with that, um, no variances, conforms, the planning department recommends approval. Okay, thanks Cameron. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P20-104 as presented to the board here tonight. Second. Motion made and seconded for approval. All right, so Vice Chair Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Uh, nice building. Aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Commissioner Horton. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Uh, yeah, great job, guys. I, I can't remember the last time we saw units that large and, uh, you know, four bedrooms is obviously something we don't see often. So I I'm going to vote aye. Motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Cameron. Bye-bye. All. Uh, all right, let's move on to case P19-191 is a minor site plan for 57 Virginia Ave. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mukti is my architect this evening. Let's see. He should be here. You can proceed. Okay, great. Um, Stephen Joseph of the Trauma Law Firm for the applicant. This is uh, 57 Virginia Avenue. It's located one lot in from the corner of MLK in Virginia in zone one of the Jackson Hill redevelopment plan. Uh, this one's a little strange because it's a, it's a small irregular lot. And under the land development ordinance, this wouldn't require site plan approval um, since it's under 5,000 square feet of floor area. But because it's in the redevelopment plan, we do require minor site plan approval. There, uh, the, the applicant's proposing five stories and three units within that five stories. 
there's no variances or deviations being requested. Mukti is our only expert this evening. And counsel, for the record, I note that this was a notice case. It was noticed for the November 10th hearing. I've reviewed the notice. It does appear to be in order, so we can mark that as A1. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Hello, everyone. Hey, Mukti, let me just hey. swear you in, all right? Yeah. Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And for the record, could you just state and spell your name, please? Mukti Bajaj, M-U-K-T-I. Last name is Bajaj, B-A-J-A-J. -A -A Ms. Bajaj, good evening. I don't think we've seen you online yet, have we? Yeah, no, not yet. Okay, uh, so we've qualified you in the past. Your license is current tonight? Yes, I do. Okay, you're qualified. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just go ahead and start sharing the screen. Straight, go to the first page. Uh, so it's 57 Virginia Avenue. This is a very tiny, small lot. The square foot area of the lot is 834 square feet. Uh, this is in between MLK Drive and Bergen Avenue. This is turnkey, uh, sorry, Jackson Hill Redevelopment Zone. Um, the lot width is 20 feet and the lot depth is uh, just 38 feet. Uh, the six stories is permitted. What uh, we are proposing is a five story building with three units. Um, the square foot area, basically there are no side yard requirements and the front yard, we comply with the front yard, which is to the curb uh, cut, which is 10 feet. Um, rear yard is not required as well, but we are providing three feet for the windows. This is lot is unique in the sense one side is the Virginia Avenue and back of or the rear, we have a railroad or the light rail station there. Um, the existing is one story commercial, which will be demolished and three or three uh, unit will be proposed there. The square foot area of the first floor is 769 square feet uh, from first to fourth floor. And the fifth floor is set back and the area is 466 square feet. So A2 is, it shows the site plan. This is the existing survey, which shows the existing one story structure. Um, there's a proposed site plan, which is almost 100% coverage with a setback at the back and a five story proposed building. We are also proposing a new sidewalk and one tree and the client will be redoing the front sidewalk. I'll just zoom and the plans. So as I mentioned, this is a very tiny project. Uh, this, we have a partial cellar where we have a garbage room, sprinkler room, a bike parking and the mechanical. Uh, on the first floor uh, towards the left of the property is the entrance to the building. And uh, there's only unit one is the only unit which is a single level. Both the other units two and three are a duplex with the mezzanine. Um, so the unit one is also two bedroom, one bath, and the square foot area, the net area is 520 square feet. Uh, well, the unit two and unit three are with a similar layout. They are like two bedroom, two bath, and with a small office. Um, so the first level is two bed, one bedroom office and one bath, and there's a spiral staircase which goes up and you have a second bedroom um, at the mezzanine level um, with a small covered terrace at the back. Um, the square foot area of uh, the unit two and unit three with a similar layout is approximately 777 square feet. So this is a fourth floor, uh, which is unit three. And similar, um, so it has a kitchen, living, dining, and a small office and a second bedroom. And the first bedroom is on the fifth floor with an attached bathroom, a common terrace, and a front rooftop deck. Uh, the roof, the common roof, just has a compressors on the roof um, and it's accessible for, uh, for all the units. So there's no rooftop deck, uh, common rooftop deck proposed. <clears throat> This is the front facade of the building. It shows a five-story building. Four, fifth floor is set back. 
Uh, we have just used a traditional brick and, uh, and a black metal siding with the black windows, which are modern yet little industrial look to the windows. Uh, as far as other side yard, um, side facades and the back facades, they'll be finished with the vinyl siding, the light gray vinyl siding and uh, lighter gray stucco on the first floor. I think that pretty much concludes my testimony. So I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Ms. Bajaj. Um, the rooftop is only accessible from the uh, the fifth floor unit, correct? The fourth and fifth floor unit? Yeah, this is a private rooftop deck only for unit number three. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the, the condenser units are where they're they're not on that fifth floor level, correct? They're on the, the stair bulkhead? Yeah, that's correct. They are on the stair bulkhead. So this this portion where we have a bedroom number one for unit three, about that, the, there's a stair, staircase bulkhead and that roof has the condensers. Okay. So this is a lower uh, roof. Are they, are the, uh, the condensers screened at all? Yeah, we have provided a screen around the condenser. Okay. Uh, the screen and the gate. Those are my only questions. Uh, anybody else, any questions? Uh, yeah, me, just one. Um, good, good evening. Good evening. I see on the uh, first level, I see two doors to the patio. Is the patio exclusive, uh, exclusively for the first floor tenant or is it for the whole building? No, this patio, uh, patio is only for the first floor. Okay. So yeah. The, oh, so those are windows. Are Oh, upper floor has the windows. Oh, so those are those are doors, patio doors. Yeah, on the first okay. floor. Oh, oh, going to the bedroom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay. Council. Anything else? And that uh, concludes our presentation. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Bajaj. Thank you. Uh, okay. If, uh, Anybody's here from public at this time, if you want to comment, please raise your hand. Uh, if you are calling in and you'd like to comment, please press star nine. Anybody from public, please raise your hand. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Public's closed. Uh, Cameron, do you have any, uh, any additional comments? Okay, um, well, Firstly, just recognizing the idiosyncrasies with this application, um, it's pretty interesting and probably something that you see at a zoning board meeting, but this application is using the transit station height bonus, which actually would allow them to go to six stories. Um, but anyway, um, you know, planning staff thinks it's interesting and all that we ask is that the applicant agree to the conditions listed in the staff report dated November 20th, 2020. The applicant agrees to the conditions. All right, and with, with that, staff recommends approval. Okay, thanks Cameron. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P19-191 as presented to the board here tonight. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for approval. All right. Vice Chair Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Allen? Aye. Nice building. Commissioner Gangadin? Aye. Commissioner Horton? Aye. And Chairman Langston? Yeah, I agree with Jeffrey. Uh, this is a, a Really great project. Um, I'm going to vote aye. Nice job, uh, Mr. Judge. Thank you. Motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay, thank you, Cameron. Thank uh, you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Mike, are you okay for one more application? And then we'll absolutely. Okay, yeah, we'll take a break right before the um, the redevelopment plan hearings. Uh, all right, so let's call case P two zero dash 006 uh, for 244 Clinton Avenue. Hello, uh, Peter Cecchinini on behalf of the applicant. Uh, good evening, Council. Good evening. 
Uh, this was originally noticed for the November 17th meeting. It was, it was uh, carried with notice uh, to tonight. Um, this is a 50 by 90 lot on Clinton Avenue. Half of the lot is vacant and the other has an existing older house on it. So the applicant seeks to subdivide it into two 25 by 90 lots and build a two family house on the lot that's currently vacant. So our uh, witness is going to be Jay Jang. So I'd like to call him at this time. Can you repeat the name? Uh, J is architect Jay Jang. J-A-E. J A N G. I don't see that. You don't name. See, um, let me just, if you don't mind, counsel, I'm oh, going to call just make sure. See someone E U N H U R? Is that part of? I'll, I'll ask him who it is. Okay. G G U N H R. Yes, that's it. That's the right one. Okay. Okay. Can you, you hear me now? We can. Okay. okay. Sure. Counselor, are you ready to move forward? Do you want me to swear him in? Yes, please. All right, uh, sir. Are you um, well? Let me just swear you in real quick, okay? Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear any testimony that you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. And for the record, could you state and spell your name for me, please? Uh, J J. Uh, first name J A E. Last name J A N G. Thank you. Mr. Jen, good evening. Uh, I don't believe we've ever qualified you, have we? No, this is my first time. Okay, so I'm sorry, go ahead, counsel. Um, uh, Mr. Jang, uh, how long have you been in a licensed architect in New Jersey? Uh, 13 years now. And is your license in New Jersey uh, current and in good standing? Yes, it is. And are you familiar with this application and all the relevant laws and ordinances related to it? Yes, I am. Okay, counsel, that's good enough for us. You're qualified, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Jang, would you like to start your? Sure. Uh, testimony, yep. Yes, uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, um, so everyone can see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So the, uh, the property is on 244 Clinton Avenue, uh, Jersey City, between uh, West Side Avenue and JFK Boulevard, uh, which is uh, our one zone. Uh, the building is on the uh, sub, like Peter mentioned, it's on the subdivided portion of the lot. Uh, this is the three-story uh, residential building for a uh, two-family home with, uh, with uh, two parking spaces on the ground floor. Uh, the two units are both uh, two bedroom, two bathroom units. Uh, each unit is about 925 square feet. Um, and so it, it has a shared entrance in the ground floor and you walk up one flight up to get to the first unit and then you walk up another flight up to get to the second unit. Um, and uh, this is building elevation. Um, where uh, the uh, first, uh, the lower third of the building is the gray brick and then the upper portion is the between, uh, between the uh, vinyl siding and the uh, brown stucco uh, material. And it has a pitched roof. So we are requesting uh, two variances for the subdivided lot uh, because there's a hardship 
on the site. Like Pierre said, uh, the uh, drawing requirements uh, is 25 by 100 is the minimum lot size, but we only, the existing lot size, lot depth is only 90 feet. Uh, so the, which, which uh, prevents us getting the minimum uh, lot size as well. So we only get two, 2250 square feet versus 12, 2500 square feet. Uh, we were originally also asking for the rear yard setback, uh, but uh, uh, after speaking to commissioner uh, the planner, um, we decided to reposition the, uh, the building so that uh, we don't we are not required we are not requesting the uh, rear yard uh, setback anymore. Um, yeah, um, I believe that this uh, you know the very variance is not going to uh, substantially impair the zoning ordinances or the master plan for the neighborhood um, because, uh, I mean, the existing lot size is only 90 feet uh, and uh, all other, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of other properties in the same street uh, has a 90 feet depth uh, lot size as well. So um, we are trying our best to um, fit the building within the site that we were given, so. Uh, so, so, <clears throat> so uh, we're seeking two variances at this point, one for undersized, for one for lot area, one yeah. for lot depth, and the original uh, rear, yard, rear yard setback variance that we were requesting is no longer required because we've moved this, the building forward. Is that correct? Correct, correct. Okay, does the, do the commissioners have any questions of the witness? Um, Actually, yeah, the, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Jang, I, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, we qualified you tonight as an architect. You're not a planner, correct? I'm not a planner. Okay, so just uh, for the commissioners, um, his planning testimony on the variances, it's, it's acceptable, but it's not expert testimony. So just for the record, that's, you know, Mr. Jang is, qualified tonight as an architect, not a planner. So that's not expert testimony. Um, but that was my only question. So uh, anybody else, any questions? Okay, uh, council, anything else from you? Uh, nothing further. Okay, thank you. Uh, so at this time, we'll open it up for public. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment, please raise your hand. If you are calling in and you'd like to comment on this application, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody from public? To the chair saying no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded to close public and we are closed. Uh, I don't have it open. Uh, I believe this is Cameron. Yeah, Cameron, do you have anything to add? Um, well, to further expand on the bulk variances for the existing undersized lot, um, this block starting at lot 46 going all the way down to lot 60 all have, uh, actually lot 61 have all depths of 90 feet. So just to give you an idea, this is an existing structure of the lock configuration on this block. Um, planning staff does not feel that the existing non-conforming slight 10 feet shorter than normal lot depth will substantially um, impact or be a detriment to the zoned plan. Um, but adding on that, planning staff asked that the applicant agree Reads the conditions from the November 13th staff report. Uh, yes, we do. All right, and just wanted to add that they've already gone and done some renovations to the existing home, 244 Clinton, and um, maybe a coincidental, but um, the house went from red to blue, which might be a metaphor or foreshadowing some recent political happenings, but 
Anyway, with the applicant's agreement to the conditions in the staff report dated November 13th, um, planning staff feels that the variances here are de minimis and recommends approval. Okay, thank you, Cameron. Uh, just for your comments, not your political commentary, but uh, thank you. Okay. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P20-006 as presented to the board here tonight. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for approval. All right, so Commissioner, well, Vice Chair Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Commissioner Horton. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. All right, motion carries with conditions. Thank you, board. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, uh, we are gonna take a 10 minute break, everybody. Um, I see Don Pepe's hand is raised. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> we're getting to you, Don. And uh, when we come back, we're gonna hear the uh, redevelopment plan for uh, Water Street, 100 Water Street, okay? Uh, it is 7.07 .07 now. We'll be back at 7.17.
Hi, James. Is Rob G part of your presentation? Uh, hello, Erica. Yes, he is. Okay. Also, Ed Colling. Gotcha. Okay, could we come to order again, everybody? Council, good evening. Just give us one second until everybody's back. Take your time. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, all right, let's call um, item 17 on the agenda tonight. Uh, the review and discussion of amendments to the Water Street Redevelopment Plan regarding the split zone sites, Route 440 widening, Water Street improvements and transfer of floor area. Uh, the amendments were petitioned by 100 Water Street LLC. Formal action may be taken and this was carried from the November 17th meeting. Uh, good evening, commissioners and Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, council. Um, as you know, my name is Jim McCann from the law firm of Connell Foley in Jersey City. Uh, I am here tonight appearing on behalf of the applicant, 100 Water Street Development, LLC. Uh, this is an application that is seeking uh, an amendment to the Water Street Redevelopment Plan. Um, as such, the relief requested uh, is simply that the planning board issue a favorable recommendation to the Jersey City Municipal Council uh, for a final determination on this amendment by the council. As you know, um, for redevelopment plan amendments, only the Jersey City Municipal Council can make the final de decision. The planning board uh, issues its recommendation on the amendments to the council. Uh, for the record, uh, the Water Street Redevelopment Plan did not require that this applicant provide any special notice to the public in preparation for tonight's hearing, uh, so none has been provided. Um, the applicant's filings in this matter are all uh, posted on the Planning Department's web portal. Uh, they consist of a letter ap application filed by the applicant to the Director of Planning dated September 29th, 2020. Uh, a handful of exhibits, some of which you will see tonight, uh, and the text of the proposed amendment to the redevelopment plan. Uh, and also for the record, the applicant did pay the filing fee required by the redevelopment plan. Uh, in terms of the planning division's response, the applicant uh, and myself have been working with Matt Ward from the planning division to uh, fine tune the concept uh, behind this amendment as well as the language that's going to be presented to you. Uh, in terms of council outreach, uh, I can state for the record that the applicant has met a number of times with Councilwoman Prinzari. Uh, this is her ward and that she supports this application. Um, in terms of a presentation tonight, I have a handful of slides uh, to, to show the board uh, where the property is, what the amendment is, um, and then I have uh, Ed Colling, uh, who is going to give planning testimony explaining to you the amendment as well as the community benefits associated therewith. I have two witnesses. My first witness is Rob Giannone. He is a, uh, a, a 
development representative, development manager for the applicant. He's running the slideshow for us tonight. I will ask him a few questions about a few pictures that were taken. Um, and then I have Ed Colley. Um, so having said that, I'm gonna give you a brief uh, introduction. Uh, what you see on the screen in front of you right now uh, is an aerial view uh, of the applicant's site. This, uh, this uh, aerial view map has been on record with the planning department and has been presented this board a number of times since 2017 when we've appeared here for this project. Uh, you can see that the site, uh, which is bordered in yellow there, uh, it, to the north, there's Clark Avenue, uh, to the south, there's Claremont, and then uh, of particular importance to tonight's presentation, you can see the project is, uh, the site is bordered on the west uh, by first Water Street, uh, and then Route 440. And you can see sandwiched in between Water Street and Route 40, uh, there, are, there are some real property uh, that is owned privately uh, with some improvements thereon. Uh, Rob, you could take us to the next slide, please. Um, this is a tax, a current tax map uh, of this area. Um, this is on the planning department web portal as part of this application. Uh, the purpose of this is to just give you a better look at the uh, actual, the applicant's development site uh, this is also representative of a subdivision that this board granted to the applicant in 2017. And Rob, if you can show us uh, block 20730, uh, that's part of the development site. Um, that's lot 201. Below that is lot 301, which is a street infrastructure lot uh, uh, that was created pursuant to the subdivision. Uh, the applicant is connecting Yale Avenue, um, which is currently a dead end, to Clark Avenue at the intersection of Bennett. Uh, and the applicant is also building a roadway that connects Yale Avenue to Claremont Avenue to the south. Um, other development lots that were created by the subdivision are on block 20704. You can see lot one uh, where the cursor is. And then to the north of that, you can see lot two. Now, all the lots that I just uh, pointed out to you, uh, this board in 2017 granted a site plan approval to the applicant uh, for the construction of a mixed use community on, the, on this site um, with residential, uh, commercial, um, uh, permanent parking, as well as interim parking. Uh, you may recall a couple of months ago, we appeared here on the the site that's lot 201, those buildings there, that building is under construction in two parts. Um, and then on uh, the uh, property to the south, uh, lot one, there's an interim parking lot as well as lot two, but there are no permanent improvements uh, constructed on those sites as of yet. Now, the real important part of this tax map, you can see uh, to the west, you can see there are two colorized lots. Uh, the first one is in um, block 20701, that's lot four. You can see that it's in light blue. And to the south of that is uh, lot five in that same block that is in orange. Those are the, uh, the lots that I pointed out to you in the original aerial that are sandwiched between Water Street and Route 440. And I will tell you for the record as the applicant's attorney that the owner of each of those lots had approached the applicant and asked if the applicant would purchase their property. And the applicant has accepted the offer of both property owners to purchase their property. As such, um, the applicant has an interest in both of those properties as we speak tonight. Um, and most of the presentation that Ed Colling is gonna uh, explain to you about the amendment is gonna discuss these two uh, lots. Now, just to give you a better idea of those lots, we have taken a few pictures, um, which would be the next uh, series of slides. And, um, Rob Giannoni, are you out there? 
yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mike, can you swear? Uh, Rob? Hi, Rob. Let me just swear you in, all right? Yep. Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And for the record, could you just state and spell your name, please? Sure. Robert Giannone, R-O-B-E-R-T. Giannone is G-I-A-N-N-O-N-E. Good evening, Mr. Giannone. And uh, you're testifying on behalf of the applicant. Uh, you're not being qualified as an expert in any way tonight, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Before uh, we jump in, uh, Jim, can we just, uh, I think some of the, are you going to mark all this as one? I think I see 14 slides. Uh, uh, so there, there's only to? three pictures, three photographs. We'll mark okay. them all as uh, whatever you say. We can mark them all together. Okay, sounds good. Just describe them and we'll mark them. Sure. As well. uh, Rob, can you uh, identify the, the slide that's on the screen right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this photo is taken from the um, median of Route 440 looking north. But, um, but Rob, just real quick, did you take that picture? I did take that photo on November 17th. Okay. And uh, let me ask you just a couple of quick questions. In the background of that photo, uh, there's a building there called the Agnes. Is that part of the applicant's project? Correct. That's phase 1.1. Okay. And then to the north of that, there's another building. Is that part of the applicant's project? That is not, no. Right. That's a separate project on the other side of Clark Avenue, correct? Correct. That's 16 Bennett. Okay. And then what's the green building uh, to, to the north and, and the white building uh, immediately south of it? Sure. So, so the, the green roofed building here is a um, fruit market um, that is on lot five of block 20701. Um, and just to the south of it, it's actually not a permanent structure. It's a temporary tent that they have, uh, depending on the weather, which is just an extension um, of the fruit market space all the way down into uh, this fence line here, which is uh, an outdoor portion of the fruit market space as well. And, and that would be lot four then? Uh, lot four begins after this fence line, correct? Okay. Um, and and that, of course, that's Route 440 right there in the foreground, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and then, and that site that we just described, that's the site that the applicant um, is purchasing from the owner, correct? Correct. Okay. And then, can you show us the next picture? Did you also take this photograph? I did. Same day. And same day, November 17th, 2020. Correct. Okay, correct. and is this the other lot? Is this um... correct? This is this is uh, lot five, um, where the um, it's used as a pseudo parking lot. Um, there's parking a lot. structure, correct? Okay, um, again, right on 440, and in the background is the applicant's project, correct? Correct. All right, one more slide. Okay, did you take this picture, Rob? November 17th, 2020. Okay, and, and this basically shows Route 440, and it shows uh, in the distance, at first it shows lot four, then it shows lot five. Um, I'm sorry, backwards. First it shows lot five, Correct. then it shows lot four. No curbs at all, and it shows the kind of informal jackpot parking lot that's there on Route 440. That is correct. Okay, all right. I don't have any further questions of Rob about these pictures. Um, Matt, can we mark these as, I guess, A1? Yes, please. Okay. And Mr. Giannone, just for the record, please don't stand on the median on Route 440 anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. That was a one-time <laughs> instance. Okay, good. <laughs> With your any, back to traffic. <laughs> anything, to get, anything to get an approval. <laughs> don't, tell, don't tell him that. We might have to send him out there again. <laughs> All right. Uh, my next witness is Ed Colley. Hi, Ed. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, I do. Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Uh, my first name is Edward. Last name is Colling, spelled K-O-L-L-I-N-G. 
Mr. Collin, good evening. Um, we've qualified you in the past, obviously. Uh, I hate to even ask you, but is your license current tonight? Uh, yes, yes, my license is uh, current and paid up to date. Okay, thank you. You're qualified. Ed, Ed you're the planner for this project? Uh, yes, yes, sir, yes I am. And, uh, and up on the screen right now is the proposed amendment that we're asking this board to, uh, to take action on tonight, correct? That's correct. And, and did you, myself, and the applicant prepare this amendment? Yes, uh, yes we did, we worked together on it. Okay, all right, would you be kind enough to, uh, to walk the board through the amendment and if you need us to, uh, to move back to the tax map or the photos, uh, we'll be happy to do it, but. Um, right. You know, what I'll do is sort of briefly just kind of discuss an, an oversight, an overview of it. I mean, this has been submitted to the board. After I do the overview, we can go through the individual items if the board uh, would like, or they can, they can decide if they want to move forward with it. But just to give the brief overview, the, uh, the, these amendments are really relatively straightforward. What you see on before you here now is just an introductory paragraph it just sort of explains the purpose of the amendments, and that is to facilitate the widening of Route 440, and that's to accommodate the proposed 440 Boulevard as envisioned in the Jersey City Master Plan. It's also referenced in the Land Development Ordinance. It's something that the city has been working on as a long-term goal and objective for some time. I also want to point out that these amendments do not create any new uh, development rights. What they're simply intended to do is to take the development uh, that's permitted, the floor area, that are on lots four and five on block 20701, and just to transfer them across the street to lots one and two on block 20704. There's also going to be no new bulk standards or reduction in setback standards or anything like that, except that the permitted height on lot two only would be allowed to go up three more stories. Currently permitted there is 12 stories. We're, we're seeking to make that 15 stories. And that's basically simply to accommodate the floor area that could have been built on lots four and five at a height of, of 12 stories there as well. And we felt that the lot one was the best, or lot two, I'm sorry, was the best place to put the additional floor area because it's the most distant from the existing neighborhood it's shielded from the existing neighborhood by development that's already been approved by this the same developer and therefore would have the least amount of impact. And it's simply three more stories on what is really the smallest parcel in the, in the development. Um, there also would be a benefit of that really is that it eliminates the cost of acquisition for lots four and five. If and, and what, by, what, what would this development or the, what this amendment would do, especially the developer will agree to transfer the land to the city and therefore there's no cost of acquisition. There's no need to use eminent domain. There's less legal fees. Sorry, Jim. So the less legal fees that will be, be accrued and it, it hopefully will all work more smoothly together. There's also substantial improvements. So it's not just the land. These amendments will, um, will require the developer to make certain improvements to, the, to Water Street, uh, would include new curbing, new street paving, new stormwater improvements, street trees, landscaping, bike lanes, sidewalks to enhance pedestrian safety, the curb cuts along the and driveways along 440 that you saw in those photographs that would all be eliminated. New curbing would go there. And all these uh, improvements will be done in the public right of way or what will become the public right of way. And those will be enhancements that'll be a community resource available to the general public, just as any other public street or right of way in Jersey City. Um, some of these improvements will uh, implement the Route 440 Boulevard as envisioned right from the beginning such as separating 440 from that, the, uh, the, the, that parking area, if you wanna call it that, and closing up the, uh, those open curb cuts and things like that, that'll create the, the differentiation between the through lanes and Water Street, which is, going, which is a 
uh, more of a local street and is envisioned as more of a local street in the uh, improvements that are being envisioned for the whole thing. So these improvements also, they're not part of, of this, this amendment necessarily in terms of the, the detail of them because they are, have to be designed in consultation with Jersey City Planning, the Division of Engineering, the Department of Transportation. They'll all be part of the evolution of the, of the design process and will be brought to the planning board as part of the future developments that are, that are being proposed on lots one and two where the transfer development rights are going to go. So um, at the end of the day, the developer will dedicate the entirety of lots four and five to the city to be used in the ultimate expansion of Route 440 and will make, uh, will agree to make at a sole cost and expense the improvements that are outlined in the, in the uh, amendments. Um, we can go through those amendments uh, if the board has not reviewed them. I mean, so I'll, I'll defer to the board first to ask what, if you'd like to go through that. So Ed, before, before we end, um, Rob, can you just bring up the tax map again? Just if I can summarize it in a nutshell, um, Ed, what you're saying is the colorized lots, uh, the, the ones in blue and orange, what we're asking for in the amendment is to take the floor area rights from those two lots and move them across the street over to lot one and two, correct? That's correct. Lots four and five are about 12,000 square feet, plus or minus. Yep. Yep. And there's something over 93,000 square feet of floor area that, that would be then moved over. And the value of those would have to be obviously purchased if it was going to be done conventionally through eminent domain and, and the acquisition of the right of way and that sort of stuff. And, and so the reason this is important is because the city already has a plan in place for the eventual widening of Route 440, correct? Yes, there is, there, there is a plan. And, um, and in order to do that, they would have to acquire these two lots. Exactly. Okay, so, so our client is going to acquire them and agree to dedicate them at no cost to the city as part of this amendment, correct? That's correct. And, and in addition, our client is agreeing uh, to make improvements to Water Street and to those lots that will um, uh, uh, be consistent with the Route 4440 widening, um, as well as provide some parking and a, a, a very much spruced up Water Street uh, for the public's use, correct? Correct. Water Street will be improved. The, the curbing, especially on the east side, will be located in the appropriate location. The curbing along New Jersey Route 440 will be in the appropriate location. In between there, there, the amount of space that will be allocated will be sufficient to accommodate all the improvements that are envisioned in the long term. And in the near term, there'll be improvements for the sidewalk, street trees, everything that I enumerated before, as well as public parking because it'll be become part of the public right of way, just like any other right of way in the city and the, the community residents, neighbors, whatever, whoever can, can use that, that street as they would use any other right of way for driving, for parking, for the bike lanes or the pedestrian ways. So there's a long-term public benefit and both a short-term public benefit. Correct. Okay, and the reason we often come with a concept plan that shows exactly what we're doing when we have an amendment, we don't have one tonight because we've agreed with the planning division that the developer is going to work in concert with Mr. Ward or whoever else in planning to work on the, the, a mutually desirable way to develop that area for both permanent and temporary improvements, correct? That's, that's correct. There, there is a, uh, a cross section, I believe, in the, in the master plan. Um, there may even be some, some of that in the land development ordinance, but those things evolve over time uh, as, as projects come to fruition. And we would certainly want to be consistent with whatever the most up-to-date and uh, requirements and or goals and objectives are. And as I said, the, the, the applicant already has a site plan approval for lots one and two. Once the development lights, uh, the FAR rights transfer over, it can come back and ask for amend, an amendment if it wants to, uh, 
to develop those two lots with the additional FAR, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, Chairman, I don't have any more questions for, for, uh, for Ed. If, if the board wants to focus more on the amendment, we can, but, but that's basically our presentation. Okay, thank you, Council. Um, actually, I will defer to Matt Ward. Um, Matt, I, I mean, I've gone over this plan. Um, you've gone over this plan. Do, do you think Mr. Collings testimony and the presentation is is sufficient or do you want to actually get into you know line by line presentation on the, the plan? I think it was a very good coverage uh, given by the testimony here tonight. Uh, the thing I would add is that um, lot four and five are fully within the, the setback line for the route 440. Um, and uh, I just to expand on some of the design discussion. So the board may be um, familiar through applications or just through driving uh, that corridor. Um, some of the temporary buffers uh, with certain sites, um, recent applications include uh, the self-storage building near Munipa uh, or the Starbucks just north of um, this area on Clark, on the other side of Clark Street, um, as well as perhaps the Home Depot or Raymore Flanagan um, site that have a, a, this setback um, implemented. And uh, as discussed, the, the design um, may be more in flux, especially since um, Bayfront may be um, implemented in the, in the near future and its roads actually may be um, starting construction. Uh, and with that effort, uh, which should be coming before the board soon. Uh, there, there will be, there has been some greater thought, more recent thought given to the section of, of the Route 440 Boulevard. Um, so that was testified to tonight. And um, I don't know if we need to get much further into um, mechanisms of uh, this amendment uh, and, and we could move toward uh, public comment. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll defer to the board. I I'm satisfied with the testimony. I think it covered the, uh, the amendment very well. Uh, so anybody, any questions? Any questions from the board? Mr. Chair, I'm good with the explanation Mr. Colling made as well. Okay. All right, so if we have no questions, um, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody wants to comment, please raise your hand. Anybody from the public? If you are calling in, you can press star nine. I see one hand raised. Council, perhaps we could stop the screen share. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chris, are you able to turn your video on? Uh, yes. Hold on. Hold this thing. Okay. All right, I just wanna swear you in before you get started, okay? Yeah. Can you raise your right hand? On the right. Do you swear any testimony you're going to give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes. And for the record, could you just state and spell your name, please? Uh, Chris Gadsden, C H R I S G A D S D E N. Chris, good evening. Uh, don't worry about the hand. Everybody does the same thing. Um, and we have five minutes for you. No, I just had to, uh, just some clarifying questions about um, lots four and five. Um, I heard you say that, that these lots will eventually be dedicated to the city so that it will allow for the expansion of Route 440 or, or, or the widening of it. Uh, but then you also said that um, there could also, well, I don't know if I heard you say that there, there could be also development on lots four and five. Um, and so I would like to just know, uh, would it be developed or will it just be left alone and eventually be incorporated into the widening of um, Route 440. And then also um, being that I haven't been attending these meetings uh, frequently, um, I would like to see how that portion of 100 waters, you know, like, you know, the water street project, how did that look? Um, like, how did that expansion look? How did that parcel of land, um, how, how would that be incorporated in the expansion of, um, you know, Route 440. So I guess in Route 4 and 5, um, and Lots 4 and 5, would there be any development on top of the land? Because I heard you say that 
you're going up a couple of stories. Is that on lots one and two, or is that going to take place in four and five? And if four and five eventually be dedicated to the city, how would that expansion look on Route 440? Those are just questions I had. Oh, um, um, Commissioner, I think I can answer Chris's questions. Um, okay. Before, Unless you want Matt Ward to, that's fine. No, no, before I, uh, um, before we let Chris go, are those your only questions, Chris? Yeah, for this one, yeah, this one. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll, uh, we'll keep you on for a sec, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Council. Uh, Chris, um, so lots four and five are to be dedicated uh, to the city of Jersey City. There would be no private development on those two lots. The floor area that is permitted from those two lots would then be moved over to lot one and two, which on the tax map was east of Water Street and, and the development rights would go there. So um, lot four and five would be dedicated to the city. The improvements that were referenced in the presentation would be improvements that would facilitate and further the widening of Route 440. Um, and in the interim, in concert with the city planning department, uh, the developer is willing to um, make certain improvements to Water Street and put some parking on Water Street really as temporary improvements that would serve the community until the Route 440 widening is done. And Ed, have I answered that question properly? Yeah, I think what, you know, I think was the misunderstanding might have been the use of the word improvements. When we're talking about improvements, we're talking about street trees, street lighting, curbing, paving, sidewalks, that kind of thing. Those are the only improvements. Parking. So you're saying after um, after all this is done, Water Street is still going to exist. It's just going to have the improvements on it. And, yes. and so um, I guess the last question. So the farmer's market, and then that's going to be purchased by the developer? Yes. Okay. And then that whole land is going to be stripped clean and just waiting for the city to use it to widen uh, 440. Yes, the, the applicant will demolish the existing improvements on, on those lots, yes. Okay, and there's nothing gonna be built on that um, land um, at all, it's just gonna be curb cuts and just things to beautify that particular stretch of land. Yes. Okay. And council, for the record, currently under the plan, those lots four and five could be developed and built upon today. As it as it sits under the yes yes council they could yes right and that's where it becomes an issue with Route 440 expansion and then being fully within the widening uh, of the area of the, the road fully within the setback line um, so this is a this is a good mechanism for relieving that issue. And there are others along this corridor, uh, but none quite as significant or uh, exacerbated by the setback line as, as these two sites. Okay, thanks guys. Chris, anything else? Sorry, I just demoted him. Okay. Um, all right, anybody else from public? If you'd like to comment, please raise your hand. Seeing no more public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Um, Matt, I know you've uh, commented already. Do you have anything else to add? Staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, make a motion to accept and approve the review and discussion of amendments to the Water Street Redevelopment Plan regarding the split zone sites, uh, Route 440 widening, Water Street improvement and transfer of the floor area and uh, forward to city council with a favorable recommendation for formal adoption. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for um, um, approval. A motion to approve, Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Gangadon. Aye. 
Commissioner Horton. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Yeah, um, this is a big part of that puzzle. Uh, this is this is really important, guys. Uh, I'm an I. Motion carries all in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Jen. Uh, all right, let's move on to the review and discussion of amendments to the Exchange Place North Redevelopment Plan regarding the addition of research, testing, laboratory uses. Uh, this is petitioned by Cali Harborside Associates, LP. Formal action may be taken. I am looking for Chuck Harrington, but I do not see him. There he is. Okay, I'm promoting him. I was looking for Charles, actually. So, <laughs> Chuck, I have to <laughs> I refer to you as Chuck, but I was looking for a Charles. So, <laughs> you have the floor, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorry. If you could promote Tom Golden as well, he's a representative from the um, Mac Cali entities. Just promoted. Okay. So, um, yeah, for the record, um, Charles Harrington of Connell Foley on behalf of the uh, applicant here. Um, what uh, the, the board or some of the board members may recall that we were before uh, the, the uh, planning board um, probably about two years ago, um, a year and a half to two years ago, we actually had a meeting down at the uh, planning uh, office uh, in that, that room right outside their, their offices. And we had proposed a similar, actually the same um, amendment at that time. Uh, for the Colgate redevelopment plan uh, to permit uh, this type of use. Uh, and we're specifically looking at 95 Green Street uh, because a, a new owner was coming in and they wanted to uh, really explore the life sciences uh, uses uh, in Jersey City and, and, and this uh, metropolitan area. So what we're proposing tonight is to extend the same, the same use, same language uh, uh, to be permitted in the exchange place north redevelopment plan. So if you're you know not familiar with that or I know it was uh, put in your materials the this redevelopment plan uh, runs from uh, essentially your your 50 70 80 90 Columbus uh, projects there with the the Marriott uh, up by Grove the Grove Street path station at the corner of Columbus and Marin and then it runs east uh, towards uh, along Columbus Drive, all the way down to uh, Exchange Place uh, Path Station. And then you come into the Mac Cali Harborside uh, complexes. So you've got, you know, Plaza 1, 2, 3, 4, 4A and 5, or, uh, you know, predominantly office, the office buildings. <clears throat> what Mac Cali has, is, is proposing um, is to pr uh, uh, permit this use so that uh, they can attract similar users. Uh, I think this is a, a use that that um, is is something that will be in demand, especially in this area. And I think, especially in light of uh, you know today's environment, where I think everybody's going to be relooking at at how much they use office space and what they use it for. Uh, these types of uses are are uses that you can't do at home, right? You need you need the space. You need um, you know, the adequate uh, facilities. And I know specifically uh, my client is looking at 4A, uh, Plaza 4A has is already, can probably accommodate these types of uses because they have higher ceilings. So it's uh, particularly suited for it. Uh, and then they see it maybe as an expansive use uh, within the other, the other complexes uh, within the Harborside Plaza. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's really, you know, the, the the, uh, the crux of it. Um, I mean, I can't. I also can represent. I did reach out to Councilman Solomon, who was uh, involved in in the first go around with the Colgate redevelopment plan, um, and I sent him all the materials about three weeks ago. And you know, he just succinctly told me, "Hey, you know, thanks, thanks for the heads up." You know, um, so he hasn't gotten back to me. I assume he's he's good, you know, with with this because we we flushed it out last time too, and and obviously we'll we will. Uh, if this is approved, we would uh, 
you know, have any further discussions with him at the council level. Um, so I do have, um, you know, Tom Golden is with me tonight. Uh, he, he can answer any questions that the board may have, but it's, it's really straightforward in that we're, we're proposing it to be a, a permitted use in all the districts. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll see you know, most of the districts, well, not most, there's the districts down on the waterfront, the, the Mac Cali Harborside have a lot of office buildings already here. There are, there are still some opportunities to build additional office space. Uh, the properties that I mentioned earlier, 50 through 90 Columbus are already built out, they're residential buildings and, and hotel buildings. So it really doesn't affect that, that portion of the redevelopment plan. It's really as you, you head east and, and you get into the, uh, the Harborside Mac Cowley complex. Uh, Chairman, if I may, Mr. Harrington, the only question that I had, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's making a use permitted within the plan. What does it do, if anything, regarding setbacks and bulk standards and, and things of that nature? This is going to be interior outfitting, it, it seems like. Yeah, no, this would not affect any, any set existing setback or building requirements. It's just within the building that this use would be permitted. Okay. Chairman, I think the definition is, you know, clear. So I, I don't know how much more we need other than literally reading the definition that's being proposed for research slash test laboratory and, and what that is. But I, I mean, yeah, I will. Um... I'll defer to the board. Uh, I have no questions for Mr. Golden. I think it's very straightforward. Um, I don't know if we need to call him, but uh, let's ask if anybody has any questions. Commissioner, is anything? Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Council, I think we're good. Mr. Golden, thank you for coming tonight. But uh, I don't think we need any testimony. Okay. Okay. Uh, so at this time, I will open it up for public comment. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment on this application, um, I'm sorry, redevelopment plan change, um, please raise your hand. If you are calling in and you'd like to comment, please raise your hand. You can press star nine to raise your hand. Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Um, I don't know who this is. Matt, is this yours or Erica? It's mine. I'm sorry. So I'll just uh, I'll just interject. Um, so there's a good reason why uh, redevelopment is such a flexible tool. Um, the uses are living and breathing things that we need to consider from time to time. Uh, staff recommends approval. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept and approve the review and discussion of amendments to, uh, to the Exchange Place North Redevelopment Plan regarding the addition of research testing laboratory uses and uh, forward to City Council with a favorable recommendation for formal adoption. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for approval. Um, motion to recommend to Council, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Gengadin? Aye. Commissioner Horton? Aye. Uh, Chairman Langston? Uh, yeah, I agree with Matt's assessment. Um, this is essentially why we have redevelopment plans. So, uh, you know, we can change with the times. And I think this is, like Mr. Harrington said, uh, a use that you can't do from home. I know everybody's, not everybody, I'm not, but uh, a lot of people are working from home now. And, uh, yeah, this is one that you have to physically be there for. So uh, this is a, a change for the positive. So I'm gonna vote aye. Motion carries, all in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, let's move on to the re item 19, review and discussion of amendments to the block uh, 13102 redevelopment plan regarding provisions of affordable housing. Uh, the amendments were petitioned by PH Urban Renewal LLC care of the McCalley Corporation, uh, formal action may be taken. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be presenting it, Ashley. I'm just gonna see Hollenbeck. Don's tied up, so just wanted to let you know. Okay. 
Uh, good evening, yeah, Chairman and Commissioner. Books behind you there. <laughs> yeah, law library. <laughs> Ashley Brin from Sprincy Hombeck on behalf of the applicant. Um, we are building a project located at 25 Christopher Columbus Drive, which is part of the Block 13102 redevelopment plan. As part of this approval, we have an obligation to deliver 35 affordable housing units that would remain affordable for 20 years. We are here this evening to ask for an amendment to that plan that would allow us to provide those affordable units off-site at a Mac Cali owned building on Washington Street known as Monaco. Instead of providing those units in a year and a half, we are proposing to provide 40 units right away in the Monaco building. The units will be initially fully furnished and available right away. 40 units will be provided instead of 35 and they will be affordable for 30 years instead of 20. We are looking for a favorable recommendation. Um, and with respect to this application, we have had discussions with planning staff as well as met with Councilman Solomon in whose ward the project is located. And that's it. Thank you. That's, uh, that's the entire presentation. Um, I think Don might be joining in. Just one moment. So that the board is uh, aware of the location if the, if it wasn't clear, um, the application uh, that came before the planning board on a couple of occasions is located at 25 Christopher Columbus. It's at the corner of Washington, Christopher Columbus and Warren. It actually extends from one street to the, to the other. Um, and it is under construction at the moment if you're in that area. Um, did Don have further comments that he wanted to provide? If, if he's here, I just wanted to have some time or otherwise um, um, the, the amendment language was uh, published to the data portal as well as their cover letter. Um, uh, if there has any questions, I may be able to answer them or uh, Ashley. Okay. Um... I mean, my main question is why? <laughs> you know, we, we obviously have this written into the redevelopment plan specifically for that site. Uh, why are we moving them? Actually, I think that's an answer better answer for you. Ashley, it's a win-win for both parties. The city gets uh, uh, more affordable units for a longer period of time, and we get to put those units in a very close by, lower, lower cost building since it's already been built. So just for the record, um, that obviously was Don Pepe, correct? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't know I could be heard. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, was that the answer to the question, Don? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, the, the building at uh, the Monaco building is obviously completely depreciated at this point. So, and it was built at a lower square foot construction value. So for Matt Cali, it presents a win because, you know, it, 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 it's, it's at a lower cost. And for the city, it's five additional units, 10 additional years, furnished units, and they're available much sooner. Uh, we saw this as to win-win and we presented it that way. Okay, so if if we are talking about moving them to the Monaco, why isn't that site singled out in the redevelopment plan? Uh, because the, the redevelopment plan that needs to be amended is the one where 25 Columbus is to shift it. We're gonna have to go and enter into an affordable housing agreement with the city council. We're gonna have to amend our redeveloper agreement with the JCRA. There's still a lot of steps that need to happen, but one of them is not to amend the redevelopment plan where the Monaco is. There's nothing that presents, prevents us from receiving the units there. And, okay. yeah. So again, Don, um, you know, obviously, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts to this to, to move those units, but again, you know, I don't, it, it's, it's worded a little cloudy in the redevelopment plan change. Um, 
it's just worded as, you know, within Ward E, east of Marin Boulevard. Um, so as far as the language in the plan goes, it's a little loose. You know, those, those units could go anywhere. Chairman, it does have to be within one mile, according to the proposed language, right? It's within one mile of lot 1.02 and within Ward E and east of Marin Boulevard. But to the chair's point, obviously the board, if it were to make a recommendation uh, to the council, it could be to qualify it. And quite frankly, Mr. Pepe, yeah. I think that it would be acceptable to put it in this plan if it was to be provided or looking to be provided in a specific location. I don't know if you'd have to amend the other plan to receive it if your position is that building could receive the units, whatever that building is. Uh, uh, Councilor, if it were the board's desire to do so, if they were to recommend, if they were to see clear to recommend this with the addition of language that the units be placed in the Monaco building, I actually, I did not craft this amendment language. Uh, I did review it and edit it. Um, that is our intention and we would stand by it. So again, Mr. Chairman, I just point out to the board that obviously the board's purview includes adding or subtracting uh, language in their recommendation to the mayor and council. And Chairman, as, as you're well aware, the mayor and council can adopt it, ignore it, do whatever it wants, so. Obviously, um, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable with this without that language in there that they it would go specifically to the monaco um obviously we won't call it the monaco we'll we'll list a block and lot number um but i i'm not happy with that language that you know just reads within one mile um within wardy e, east of marin boulevard um my other issue with this I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring it up, but um, you know, I understand there's more units being added than were uh, counted in 25 Columbus. Um, you know, I think the Monaco is less than one mile, if I'm correct, uh, from from 25 Columbus, uh, but. You know, I think the intent of having those units in 25 Columbus, uh, a lot of those units are going to go to families. I know, you know, I see the breakdown of the units that it's eight studios, 22 one bedrooms, uh, no less than 10 two bedrooms. Um, you know, those are a number of units where we can prevent um, children from walking to their new school, which is going to be housed in 25 Columbus. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one of my other problems with having them moved off site. Um, and I do see somebody with their hand raised right now. Uh, we will we'll open up public comment in a little bit uh, and we'll hear everybody. But, um, you know, so before the, we leave that thought um, yeah, of yeah. specifying the block and lot, uh, I just uh, want to perhaps also, if that is the wish of the board uh, as, as this progresses here tonight, uh, I don't want to uh, amend the language or I would caution you to not amend the language to include uh, as Don stated, there's a lot of other balls in the air that are agreements that need to change um, from staying on site. And I don't believe the language necessarily precludes it from staying on site. Um, but uh, if we, that's, that's why I, I'm not sure if uh, I can um elaborate on that beyond that point but uh, that, that would just be my word of caution yeah. and, and, 
Langston, for, for the record, we did provide the specific units to uh, Councilman Solomon and the planning staff when we had these discussions and the JCRA's attorneys. Uh, so it was specific units with photographs. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's a potential that we could slip these in somewhere else because the city council simply wouldn't, I, I would imagine would not accept it. Well, I just, I think the, the language that's in the plan and, and I, I agree with Matt that it, you know, I don't want to, you know, yeah, it does specifically move them to the Monaco if we write that language in there and they still could stay at 25 Columbus. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not comfortable with the vagueness of that language that, um, you know, I know we're talking about the Monaco. I know when this is presented to city council, it'll be discussed that they're going to the Monaco, but with all the moving parts in securing those units through the JCRA and all that, um, it, it's still up in the air. You know, the, the language being the language that we're looking at right now on screen, it, it doesn't specify anything. And, um, you know, forgive me for being glass half empty. Uh, I just, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable with a, a, a broad stroke like that, that um, it's within one mile and east of Marin Boulevard in Wardy. So, you know, those are my concerns. Um, besides others that I, I just, I'm not comfortable really setting precedent to move affordable housing off site when it's been written into the plan specifically. Um, but, you know, that's just me. So I will, uh, if uh, Don, if you don't have anything else, I'll open it up to the board for questions. No, I, I would just add, uh, Chairman, I, I could see how something like this could be fodder for abuse. But if anybody's familiar with the Monaco building, it's Class A building. Matt Cowley just spent in excess of, I believe, $8 million renovating the building. It is, it is you know, as, as equal to, if not superior to uh, 25 Columbus, with the exception of the issue that you raised regarding the school. But remember, that's a very low level grade school. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to affect a number of children would be somewhat limited by that fact. You know, it's, it's not like a K through 12. I think it's K through three. Sure. But, you know, those are specifically the kids I don't want walking down Washington Boulevard to school. Um, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I feel like we're, we're picking behind what's, or, or we're picking what's behind door number one for what we have currently. And, um, you know, that's just my take. Um, I, I'll open it up to the board for any questions. If anybody has any questions, comments, anything. Uh, I have a question. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, okay. So if I understand right, the plan is to move the um the kid well not the kids the um the tenants from one building to the Monaco. Which what school would they go to if they were moved to the Monaco? Does anybody know? It's a good question. I, I do not know. Uh, I do not know, Commissioner. Um, Okay. Sometimes how school boards divvy up the lines can be confusing at best. I don't think that's even been determined yet. Where where oh. did it pull from? I, I would venture to okay. say that that it may well be there because it is relatively close. I think it would be the closest school. Okay. So we're we're talking uh, roughly maybe forty kids. If they're of that age from um, 
kindergarten to fifth grade, you said, or third grade? Or third grade, yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything and else, Jeffrey? That was it. Term is a valid one, and it would be very convenient to be able to attend a school in your same building. I don't think parents of children of that age allow their children to go walk on Washington Boulevard by themselves. I think they'd be walked to school. I, I would hope not, but no, you never know. Um, all right, anybody else? Any questions, commissioners? Commissioner Warren, a quick question. Sure. I don't think I was here when they did the uh, 25 Washington, but I have read up somewhat on it. Would there be any restriction to amenities? Are they different in use in amenities between the two buildings? Or what kind of differs between the residents' access to the things in the building between the two? Um, there, I, I don't know that I have the answer to that. They are both highly amenitized buildings, roughly equivalent. I mean, there are gyms, there are meeting areas in both buildings. I don't know if there's a separate charge, nor do I think that we can charge a separate charge to affordable tenants, but that would be the same with either building. I, I don't believe that we can, but I don't know for certain. Uh, they would have access to every amenity that every other unit owner would have. Um, Commissioner Allen, I just, uh, I, I wanted to follow up with you. So the Monaco is actually- Tanya, one I don't think we've sworn you tonight. I don't think oh. we've worn you in. Right. <laughs> My license is current. Oh. <laughs> All right, Tanya. Uh, let me just swear you. Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up. So um, the Monaco is district uh, for, uh, zone for School 37, Cordero, and Hamilton Park. And um, 25 Columbus is actually supposed to be an annex. Uh, for 16 to take their early ed. Now, when the schools come in, I don't know if they would be doing a redistricting, but I, I, I just wanted to, I, do, I did know the answer, so I just wanted to follow up. Okay, Cordero is on- um, oh, Okay, is thank Erie. you. Hamilton Park. Yeah, Cordero yeah. is on Erie and Hamilton Park. Yeah, yeah. Um, which actually brings up, um, that doesn't bring it up, but something else uh, that was just mentioned, uh, going back to Commissioner Allen's uh, testimony and question. Um, I assume that I'll downtown will have to redistrict, especially with the school that you guys just um, approved recently also. Sure. Okay. Um, so council, one thing, when, whenever we talk about affordable housing in a, a site plan review, um, we do talk about the materials being the same as the other units uh, and, and the such. Um, so you you testified that, you know, the building amenities would all be open to the affordable units as well. Um, you know, you did mention that there were renovations that happened at the Monaco. Is there any difference in the units that would be marked for affordable housing? in the Monaco versus the units that are market rate in the, in the Monaco? So uh, obviously there's a, these are already constructed and we had provided photos. These were, uh, FYI, uh, these were Airbnb units. They were all rented out by a corporate tenant as Airbnb units until the city adopted an ordinance that prohibited that. That's why this block of units became available in the Monaco. Um, I, I do not have a side-by-side -side comparison, but they were not constructed to be a, a, of a lesser uh, finish. Sure. But you, you testified that. Tele televisions, beds, you know, kitchens, kitchenettes, dining, uh, cups, plates, saucers, pots, pans, <laughs> ovens, toaster ovens, microwave ovens. But you testified that that the Monaco had just undergone renovations. It has, yes. That, were, so were these units renovated as well? I do not believe they were. Okay. So we could possibly be dealing with, you know, a difference in unit materials and countertop materials and, and cabinetry and, you know, things like that. This is something we, we generally, 
want consistent between the, the market rate and the affordable units? That's why I ask. Uh, it's, it's absolutely the case that if you were to make that recommendation, I could confirm it. Uh, okay. Um, anybody I else? I, I sincerely believe that they were that they are of equal quality to all of the existing units. Okay. Because, and, because a corporate a corporate tenant of sixty units has an incredible amount of power, and I don't think that they would allow them to. Fall into disrepair. Uh, believe me, I'm not suggesting that they're in disrepair. Um, I'm sure they're fully functional. Um, do we have any idea on the the size of the units compared to what what the units were going to be in 25 Columbus? I know you know we do have a breakdown on on the bedroom side. You know, eight studios, 22 one bedrooms, and no less than 10 two bedrooms. But are they similarly sized units that we're going to be in 25 Columbus? My recollection, um, Mr. Chairman, is they're larger. It, it, it was an older building. The newer designs call for smaller units. Okay, interesting. All right. Uh, uh, Chairman, I just wanted to add, I think it was testified to, and it just came to the attention of staff, um, it also would be entering into affordable housing agreement, but the language proposed on the screen and in their amendment here doesn't explicitly state that. So the board may want to consider adding that in toward the end uh, where it references a redevelopment agreement um, or in a, a standalone sentence. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt, could you just repeat? Affordable housing agreement. Um, I know that Don, he stated that they would be entering into one, okay. um, but if the board felt more comfortable being explicit about that language, that the board may want to consider adding that sentence into the amendment. Uh, should you, should well, you I, I think that makes sense, and that could address some of the board's concerns that the language is slippery, that we have to enter into as part of the rights to do this offsite transfer, enter into an affordable housing agreement to the satisfaction of planning staff and uh, Jersey City Council. Okay. All right, so if there's no other questions. Um, Chairman, if I may, I just, is there a unit breakdown requirement existing, Mr. Pepe? I understand that we're talking about in the amendment there were, there were by bedroom and to be candid with you we do not have any we had to provide one three bedroom unit in 25 columbus that we are unable to provide in the monaco because we do not have a three bedroom unit but we did not replace that three bedroom with one two we we made sure that we added two twos to make up for the one three but otherwise the breakdown is similar as far as what's here, because I don't see that as being changed or stricken, right? It looks to me like we're adding a breakdown of, of bedroom makeup in the amendment. Is it somewhere else in the redevelopment plan that says, the way I read the existing affordable language, it's just a minimum of 5% shall be dedicated as moderate affordable housing for a period of 20 years. It's a color requirement that dictates the, uh, the, the unit mix. Okay, um, Matt, do you have anything you wanna add before we open up public? No. One, one more question, Chairman. I'm sorry, who was it? I didn't see any. Commissioner Horton. Oh, there it is. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Uh, is there any kind of following up on uh, Mr. Santos' uh, questions? Is there any position that the units would have to be located at 24, 25 uh, Christopher Street versus the one in the Monaco building? For instance, are they, you know, one's on the ground floor, whereas one would be higher up in the building or one is located with a view and the other doesn't have a view or something along those lines? We 
we weren't restricted in either instance. Color requirements don't tell you where the units need to be, but there is a, it is mixed throughout the building in, in what we're proposing in the monitor. I did not take part in the application for 25 Columbus, so I don't know exactly what the mix, where, where they were located, but I can tell you they are not isolated in any specific section. Um, they are spread throughout the building, which again was in keeping with the Airbnb practice. Yeah, I just want to make sure, you kind of threw me when you said they're all owned and located in the same area on the Monaco building. I just want to make sure it wasn't like some locked out section off or something. No, we, we, don't, we don't have a four hall. That, uh, definitely not. Okay. Um, anybody else? And Matt, I didn't hear an answer from you. Do you want to add anything before we open up public? No, at this time, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, let's open it up for public comment. Uh, if you want to comment on the redevelopment plan change, please raise your hand. If you are calling in, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I am promoting Chris Gadsden. Hello. We got you, Chris. And uh, just for the record, uh, Chris has already been sworn in tonight. Uh, you are still under oath, Chris, if you wish to be. And we have five minutes for you. I'm sorry. I got my little cell phone. Yeah, um, I remember this project explicitly uh, well because I was on the council. Um, and at that time, it was one of the 70th, um, 70 the uh, tax abatements that the full-up administration had basically uh, pushed through. And I remember the night clearly. Uh, this project um, is, is one of the last long-term tax abatements from the full-up administration. It also uh, has a uh, project labor agreement attached to it. Originally, the project went up from 23 to 60 stories. It has a million dollars in city-issued bonds. And this project uh, with the tax abatement saved the developer like $71 million over the last, well, over the course of 25 years, right? And so we were thankful for the public school, you know, me being the educator, and we hope that the school really serves the population um, of the Jersey City Public School District. Um, but we, I, I just thought that I was gonna get a more detailed explanation of why the uh, affordable housing was moved from the site. Uh, the project was given a long-term tax abatement because the mayor developed a tier system for awarding abatements. And this project was located in the mayor's first tier, which said that it, it would give a 10 year tax break if the uh, project had mixed income um, housing, uh, mixed income incorporated in it. And so that's why it was 25 uh, years because of the school, because of all the uh, agreements with the JCRA. It was also um, a connection with 100 Montgomery, which 100 and something units, their affordability was to be preserved for uh, about 20 years. So I thought when this project, uh, when I heard about this project that um, the 5% the five increase, because it's not 35, because what we were voting on at that time was 37 parcels of housing, uh, affordable housing. Um, so that was also with 100 uh, Montgomery, which was to preserve that housing for a number of years. And so um, I'm thankful that you did increase the affordable housing units, but I think that it should stay on site. Um, it, it's very appreciative because, you know, Georgia City is very much, uh, you know, you know, cost burden, but I really don't see the need in moving affordable housing off site when you already worked with the city and the JCRA and everyone else and there's mutual benefits on both sides. Um, I don't wanna tell you what to do with taxpayer money, but with over 750 uh, units of housing, you can keep the increase of three units of affordable housing at that site while extending the affordability um, you know, for 30 years, also at the site at 100 Montgomery. And um, I found it kind of disrespectful that 
this was secondhand Airbnb housing that we're talking about. We're not talking about that, that new quality housing that's being built at 25 Columbus. Um, I do not know the specifics um, around, you know, the types of, uh, you know, the housing units that's going to be provided in that new um, dwelling, the Monaco uh, that you are proposing. And you early, and the lawyer actually said earlier in the, um, uh, presentation that the units at the um, Monaco um, is cheaper uh, because the units are cheaper than the actual units at 25 Columbus. And uh, like, uh, I guess, Commissioner Langston, I just think that, that uh, those folks need to stay, the housing needs to stay uh, at 25 Columbus. And, and if you want to do Jersey City a favor, uh, we'll take the 40 uh, units of affordable housing inside of 25 Columbus and preserve the housing uh, for 30 years at both sites, 25 and at 100 Montgomery. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. We appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. And, and we would have to, I think, demonstrate to you that the units are of equal quality when we go before the city council. Because remember, this is just a recommendation from the planning board. These conversations will be held at the city council level, and I'm grateful that I'm aware of some of the concerns. Uh, when I said, just to correct the statement, when I said that they were cheaper, they're not cheaper units. I just mean that when the Monaco was constructed, it was constructed at a lower per square foot construction cost which is why this is an attractive move to my client. And I don't think, you know, I mean, we are offering these additional units and this additional time. And don't forget the units will be available up to 18 months sooner because this building is ready for occupancy right now at a time when, when housing is, is most direly needed because of COVID. Um, so it wasn't that the units were cheaper. In fact, just the opposite, they are larger. It is that it costs less to construct that building than it costs to construct a new building. But I also don't want to uh, forget about the um, additional um, agreements that were made along with, you know, with the JCRA at that time and trying to preserve the affordability in the housing. And if you are going to propose that affordability is extended at one site, the affordability has to be extended at the other site also. That, that, you, you, because you can't forget 100 Montgomery because that was a part of the deal also because there's two parcels, there's two buildings, whatever that I think, um, there's two uh, development uh, groups, whatever that own both properties. Great, counselor. And see, uh, part of the problem is my client does not, I believe, own 100 Montgomery. Those restrictions on affordability were put in place prior to my client's acquisition of 25 Columbus. So they don't control that. There, there would be no way to go back and, in, in my uh, in my understanding, to go back and, and, and affect any change to 100 Montgomery. But those units have been preserved as was promised and as was approved. But what I'm saying is like the, the ordinance that was passed by council um, has 100 Montgomery in it. It has uh, the affordability in it. It has the tax abatement um, in it for 25 years, because that's the reason, the reason why you, you have the tax abatement is because you put affordable housing inside of 25 Columbus. And that gave you, um, a longer tax abatement because, because you did that. And then also, you know, along with the school and, uh, you know, everything else. But I think that it, it's, um, and then, the, you know, the savings of $71 million over 25 years, that, of course, that's mutual benefit, whatever, because, you know, we get in the school and the city is also, you know, giving a million dollars in order to do a lot of infrastructure <laughs> with sewer and everything else at the site. So that ordinance was all encompassing along with the PLA. And I didn't even ask about is, is anyone in compliance um, because that was one of the last PLAs that was actually um, approved by the city. So that, so this ordinance is really multi-layered and uh, just moving the houses from off that site, there's other dominoes or whatever that will probably have to fall also along with that. Like, I just don't want this to just, um, the other, the, like the other components not to be taken into consideration when uh, when uh, the planning board is voting tonight, because there's, there's a lot of moving parts with this. 
Chris, we are uh, we're way over your five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll that, that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll testify that the the PLA is being honored. That uh, that is in effect. Um, as far as you know, 100 Montgomery goes. That that would be more a city council issue than us. Um, th those, you know, that language isn't in front of us tonight. But it's it's certainly something city council can, you know, can speak to on what the the original agreement was and what the original ordinance said. So um, yeah, we're just going on our language that's in our our plan tonight. Okay. But Chairman, I do have to just advise the board, obviously, that, you know, the amendment is as as presented and the request is of the board to review the amendment and to make a recommendation to the council who will ultimately take action or no action, whatever may happen by the council. Uh, the only other thing that that I would advise the board is. If the amendment is not acted upon favorably by the council or not handled by the council when it gets there, the plan stays as is, how is, where is. So I can't speak to what that means, but you know, if if nothing changes, nothing changes, and that's just how it progresses. So I, I just want the board to to appreciate that in its deliberations okay thank you council um all right let's move on with public comment i'm promoting Raphael. thank you Raphael, you can uh, unmute whenever. Oh, sorry. How's it going? Can you turn your video on? Yeah, certainly. You're muted again, sir. Mr. Wakefield? Mr. Wakefield, yes, hello. okay, we got you. All right, I just want to swear you in, okay? okay. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And could you just state and spell your name for me, please? Yes, Raphael Wakefield, R A P H A E L W A K E F I E L D. Thank you. Mr. Wakefield, good evening. We have five minutes for you. Yeah, so yeah, so I live in sorry. I live at 201 Warren Street, a couple blocks down the way. And I gotta say I'm a little hurt by this. This is a great place for uh, single people like myself, for families. And I would be really pleased to know that we could have more people struggling with rent costs living close by and not have this be such an exclusive neighborhood. So with that in mind, regardless of the legality of the matter regardless of whatever precedent may be set, I would urge the board to recommend against this amendment. I don't think it's appropriate. We should have integrated housing over possible. That's it. Yield my time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wakefield. We appreciate it. Okay. Anybody else from public? If you'd like to comment, please raise your hand. Mr. Chair, seeing no more public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded to close public. We are closed. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add? No further comment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to accept um, as presented today, the review and discussion of amendments to the block 13102 redevelopment plan regarding provisions of affordable housing um, and uh, forward to city council with an unfavorable recommendation. Okay, so we have a motion to adopt with an unfavorable recommendation to city council. So chairman, I would just say that the 
recommendation to council the motion is to recommend that council not adopt the amendment as okay. i understood vice chair's motion that is correct uh can we clarify what a yes vote is um council uh let's wait until we have a second we don't have a second oh, second okay we have a second so a as i understand the motion the motion is to not recommend the adoption by the council. So a yes vote would be to not amend the redevelopment plan. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay, uh, on a motion to not recommend uh, the amendments to the redevelopment plan. Matt, just before we call the roll, Vice Chair Gonzalez only because of the procedure here and the fact that this is going to be uh, sent over to the council for their review and action. Is there anything in particular that you want the council to know that we should be putting in our uh, report to the council regarding this as far as thoughts that you may want them to, to consider? I, I counsel, I think we can just put that in our, you know, our comments when we vote, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion stands and uh, let's say I'm going to call Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I will just say that I was very uncomfortable with the uh, with the uh, language um, of, of the, uh, the presentation and I feel that, uh, can, that our uh, planning board will be able to um, uh, allow or give better um, better language that the city council may consider uh, at the time of, of their perusal. I'm gonna vote yes. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Uh, I can't in good faith relocate somebody, you know, may, let's just say a single parent with a three-year-old who's working full time, who, you know, doesn't have, you know, all the time in the world to drop the kid off to school and get to work on time when they have an obviously obvious chance to just walk downstairs and drop a kid off, go to work, you know, come back home to a decent building. I'm gonna vote aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Uh, my comments would be, I'm not comfortable in amending the redevelopment plan. I believe affordable units uh, should be on site and not off site. My vote is a yes. Commissioner Horton. Uh, my vote is yes. I echo the comments regarding the language. Uh, and, you know, based on what my concerns were, I don't know if the uh, responses were adequate to dissuade me of any concerns I expressed earlier. Commissioner Langston. Um, yeah, my concerns are, are certainly with the language that the, the site, it's not site specific on where the units are being moved to. Um, and I, I also don't agree with moving those units off site. Uh, a, I think it sets a bad precedent. B, I don't want to see this move forward with, you know, with the Monaco being the go to building downtown to move affordable units to um you know i'm not saying that it's it's the applicant's intent but uh, you know that could turn into segregation really quickly um so that that's my concern um i'm just not comfortable moving the units off site um so i'm gonna vote yes Motion carries all in favor to not recommend the, or to, yes, to not recommend the adoption of these amendments proposed here tonight. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's move on everybody. Um, I was instructed by Vice Chair Gonzalez. Uh, he is, he has to be off for another call at 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, so, so we have an hour and 15 minutes to conduct the rest of business tonight, uh, including memorialization. So uh, 
We'll try. We'll get as much as we can. So we lose our quorum at 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, so with that said, let's call case P20-084 is a minor site plan for 383 Palisade Avenue. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes we can. Great on you, Council. Uh, wonderful. Stephen Joseph with the Trauma Law Firm for the applicant. Uh, this is 383 Palisade Avenue, mid block between Hudson and Franklin. This is in the R2D, so, R2D zone. The property is over 5,000 square feet in floor area. We're here for minor site plan approval because of that. Um, we're proposing four stories three units, that's a, a density of 52 units an acre or 70, 72 units an acre permitted. Uh, Jeff Lewis is going to be our architect this evening and let's, uh, no variances are being requested. Let's get right into it to try and save some time. Okay, Council, just thank before you. we do that, this is a notice case. I received the notice, all does appear to be in order. So we can mark that as A1 for the record. And Mr. Lewis, knowing that there are no variances involved and it is a minor site plan only because of the size, uh, I think you can quickly walk us through. And just for the record, Mr. Lewis has been sworn and qualified already tonight. And I also do wanna put on record, um, I do live on Hutton Street, but I am outside of the 200 foot radius. You're on mute, Jeff. Now I'm good? Good. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, so get my screen up. And I am on the uh, title sheet right now. I'm going to skip where we are because Stephen covered that pretty well. I just want to show this building here in the center is the building that is existing on the site. It's a three-story building. Uh, that building will be removed and replaced with a new uh, four-story building. Uh, four story three family building. Looking at the site plan, we are building on the front property line, on the side property line. Um, we have a three foot concrete walkway along the side, which has access to the backyard and also to the trash area. These things are actually a lot easier to show on the floor plan, so I'm going to go there. Uh, and the only other thing I'd mention here is the front of the building is basically staying the same. We have a, a nice existing street tree that we're going to keep. Any sidewalk or curb that we do damage, obviously we will fix and repair as, as needed. Um, going to the floor plan. So I'm gonna start here at the first floor plan. And briefly, just very quickly, here's that three foot walkway I just mentioned. And then we have an inset here uh, off of that. And that's for uh, trash recycling. And then also our meters, gas and electric meters. Uh, and then going back to the front, uh, uh, street frontage is here on Palisade Ave. Uh, the door, the main entry door is at the bottom of the building. We come into this new lobby, which uh, accesses the sprinkler room. This is a fully sprinklered building. The stair going upstairs and the ground floor unit. Uh, this unit covers the entire first floor. It is a three bedroom, two and a half bath, 1,576 square feet. Enter into a hallway with access to half bath, coat closet. In front of the building, in front of the unit is a open living kitchen dining area. To the back, there's a hallway uh, with access to washer dryer, uh, furnace. This is, uh, there are no PTEX in this building. This is a uh, ducted uh, heat and air conditioning in all of the units. Uh, and then in the back here, we have three bedrooms, two bathrooms, uh, including at the very back an ensuite uh, bedroom with a walk-in closet, bathroom, and uh, sliding doors that walk out to a new terrace in the back. This is a private terrace for the ground floor unit. Um, it is a total of 193 square feet. It's enclosed uh, the entire backyard, uh, starting at the building back here, around the back and then to our building is enclosed with a six foot board on board fence. And then also in the backyard, besides the, the uh, patio area, we have a small lawn area and a little section where we have the condenser for the first floor uh, apartment. Looking at the second floor, 
Uh, what we're doing is we're doing split, split duplexes uh, starting here, uh, front and back. So there's one unit in the front, one unit in the back, and they're basically mirroring each other with small minor differences. Uh, the front unit, which is uh, the unit two, is 1,650 square feet, and unit three in the back is a little smaller, 1,636 square feet. Both of them are four bedroom, three and a half bath units. Uh, just starting at the front one, you walk into this hallway with access to washer dryer, half bath and utility rooms, and then an open living dining kitchen area and a staircase which goes up to the next floor. It's the same in the back unit. The only differences between the front and the back unit, the front unit has a Juliet balcony off of the living area on the bottom. And then towards the back, uh, there's a 20 foot section of the first floor roof that we're using as a roof deck for the back unit. 10 feet of it will be roof, 10 feet of it will be a roof garden. Going up to the second floor, again, these units are split down the middle. In the front, uh, we have three bedrooms, two bathrooms, including ensuite, uh, master bed with walk in closet and uh, private bathroom. And the only difference between these units is again on the back, where we have a balcony off of the uh, rear main bedroom. Then we actually have a mezzanine on the third floor. This is one master bedroom suite, walk-in closet, private bathroom, and then sliding doors which go out to a private roof deck. Uh, the front roof deck is a little bigger than the back one. The front one uh, is 311 square feet. The rear one is 289 square feet. Uh, and then looking to the roof roof on top of the mezzanine, we have our four condensers, which are all for the, uh, the two upper units. And then coming to the elevations, we're doing a more modern building frontage here. And just to summarize the materials that we're looking at, uh, the main body of the building at the bottom is a uh, smooth brick, uh, red, brown in color. Uh, up above, we have cement panels in two different colors. Uh, the lighter one is a light gray color. And then the darker one obviously is a very dark gray color. Uh, all of the windows and doors on the front and the back are black aluminum frame windows and doors. Uh, and then the siding, which you have up at the top at the mezzanine level, and then on the back and the side, is going to be a uh, dark gray vinyl siding. And then just to briefly look at the side elevations, this is uh, the right side, which is almost entirely against the existing building. We'll be flashing and closing off the space where uh, where it's uh, adjacent to the building next to us. And wherever any of this that is actually exposed, we'll be doing a hard coat uh, stucco finish painted this dark gray color. Then looking at the left side, which is stepped back and has windows on it. Uh, we are proposing first to um, return the front finishes, the hardy panel finishes about six feet, a little more. And then after that, it's gonna be that same gray vinyl siding on the back. And on the bottom, we have a uh, ESA space uh, that's colored to match the color of the brick in the front. And actually that is, um, that's the presentation of the floor plans of this building. Again, we don't need any variances. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. The well, okay. only thing uh, I'd like to add to that is just a small correction. The building is and has been demolished. Um, that's reflected on the city's permit portal. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. Lewis, I have no questions. Anybody else? Okay, council, anything else from you? I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Uh, so at this time, we'll open it up for public comment. If anyone wants to comment, please raise your hand. If you're calling in, press star nine, please, to raise your hand. Anybody Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Motion made and seconded, public is closed. And um, Mallory, you have anything to, to add? Um, no comments. This is an as of right proposal. It conforms with R2D. I did share um, standard conditions of approval with um, Mr. Joseph earlier today. So I just want to confirm that he is comfortable with those. The applicant agrees. Okay. Um, so that would just be the no materials or um, anything shown in the plans can be changed without permission from um, planning staff and the planning board. Um, a the applicant shall provide an affidavit from architect of record that the construction project is consistent with approvals and all street trees and landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the forestry standards. Um, other than that, staff recommends approval. Okay, thanks, Mallory. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P20-084 as presented to the board here tonight. Second. Motion is made and seconded for approval. Okay. 
Vice Chair Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Gangadin? Aye. Commissioner Allen? Aye. Commissioner Horton? Aye. And Chairman Langston? Aye. Okay, motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you guys. And Thanks Mr. everyone. That building looks familiar, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, uh, <laughs> before we go on, um, Mike, are you okay? Or do you want a break? Can we do like two minutes, please? We can do five minutes. We'll come back. I'll um, even do four if we come back at nine. Okay, we'll come back at nine o'clock, everybody. And once again, uh, we only have uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez until 10 o'clock. And that includes uh, any board business we have tonight, including resolutions. So uh, we need to be wrapped up and done by 10 o'clock tonight. We lose our quorum. Okay, thanks. We'll see you at nine. Okay, Mike, do we have you back? All right. Hello. All right, let's come to order again, everybody. Uh, and we'll be 
We'll call uh, item 21 is case P20-107 uh, for 866 Newark Avenue. Yes, good evening, Chairman Langston, uh, commissioners of the uh, of the planning board. My name is Benjamin Wine, attorney for the applicant, AB Cruise Construction Co. Inc. The property in question is located at 866 Newark Avenue. That's block 7806, lot 23, and it is in the NC neighborhood commercial zone. The property in question is a corner property located at the northeast corner of Newark Avenue and Senate Place across from the railroad, which you will see in further detail. This lot is kind of unique in that it serves as a transition um, within this small section of the NC zone uh, between the industrial properties to the west, the uh, almost exclusively residential larger developments to the north, and the, uh, and the true mixed use neighborhood commercial uh, developments to the east. And then like I, like I indicated, the railroad across the street to the south. The applicant is here tonight seeking preliminary and final major site plan approval to adaptively reuse an existing single story rundown auto body shop. And, uh, and you'll hear uh, specific testimony as to how that will look and to construct four additional stories atop that building to consist of residential use. So the specific development will be four stories of, uh, of eight residential dwelling units over a ground floor adaptively reused commercial space and uh, an accessory parking for the residential. Um, we do have a few bulk variances associated with the application. I'll, I'll quickly just identify what those are. It's a rear yard setback requirement uh, of 15 feet where the existing building is at zero feet and we're proposing for the new portion to be set back four and a half feet. We do have an existing curb cut, which is not permitted. We are proposing to modify it, reduce it significantly, but, uh, but to keep it and, and make use of, uh, of the curb cut. We're also proposing a, or seeking a variance for rooftop appurtenance coverage of 27.73%, where 20% is permitted. And finally, the rooftop appurtenance setback of 5.5 uh, feet from Senate Place, where 9.75 feet are required. My witnesses with me tonight are the project architect, Mukti Bajaj, as well as the project planner, Ed Calling. So unless you have any particular questions of me, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move to have Mukti Bajaj added and allowed to share her screen. Sure. And uh, once again, for the record, Ms. Bajaj has been sworn and qualified. She is still under oath. Thank you. And Chairman, for the record, this is a notice case. I am in receipt of the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the application this evening. All does appear to be in order, so we can mark that as A1 for the record. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so, Mukti, why don't you share your screen? And, uh, and we'll orient, uh, we'll walk the, bo the board through the, uh, the existing conditions of the site, as well as what we are proposing as a site plan. Yeah, sure. Just want to show this, just to start with, just want to show this existing structure, which is, this property is a corner of Senate Place and Newark Avenue. And this is an existing auto body shop with the garage entrance at the back. This is another shot from on Newark Avenue. Um, so this is an existing one story structure. This is 866 Newark Avenue. The block is 7806 and the lot is 23. Um, this is in the corner lot on Senate Place and Newark Avenue. Um, there are two curb cuts on this property, one on the Senate place, which is 15 feet, six inches, and uh, one on the second curb cut or the depressed curb is on the Newark Avenue, which is 10 feet. Um, at this point, uh, we, I mean, we are proposing uh, four stories on top of existing one story masonry. Uh, so upper floors will be eight units. Um, and uh, and we are requesting a couple of variances. This is an undersized lot. So the lot depth is 85 feet, whereas normal or the standard required is 100 feet. Uh, but, but the lot width is a little over. The required is 25 and we have 30 feet width. Um, so the lot area is 2,610 square feet. So this particular property is an NC zone where uh, we do comply with most of the bulk requirements. Uh, the only variances we are requesting for the upper floor for the rear yard variance. 
uh, which is required is 15, and we are proposing four feet six inches. Um, also, once you look at the plans, you you know even though we are requesting a mechanical and uh, roof bulkhead variance, but if you look at the plans, this is the minimum what we have provided. Um, and just go over the plans again. And the lot coverage and the building coverage is 100%. That is because of the existing structure, which covers up the 100% of the lot. So the first floor square foot area is uh, 2,610. And second floor to fourth floor is same as 2,386 square feet. And Mukti, can, that, that's just because of the, uh, the slight reduction in depth of the building, yeah, correct? that's okay. correct. All right, so if you'd like to go to the existing conditions and the site plan and just walk the board through before we get to the building itself, what uh, proposed what we're proposing to do to the, the site and around yeah. the site. So this is the existing structure. This is a survey which shows the existing one story masonry structure. There's one um, curb cut which is on the Senate place towards uh, north of the property. And the second one is on the Newark Avenue towards the east of the property. Um, so, uh, and this is the demolition plan where we are keeping the structure, only the sidewalk, sidewalk and uh, curb cut will be redone. Let's zoom the site plan. There we go. So on the upper floors, we are like, there are windows on the existing structure towards the right, uh, which is the existing, looks like a very old masonry building. And we are having a setback from that particular building of three feet one. At the back, there's just a open parking. And that's why we could give a backyard variance of four feet six at the back. Um, also, the whole sidewalk will be redone. We are proposing three trees. Uh, and plus the curb cut, which is was 15 feet six, we are reducing that to 10 feet. Um, and we have differentiated the pavers for the driveway for the pedestrians. So it's easy to identify. So that will have a different colored concrete paving and the pavers will be around the tree as well. Okay, great. And Mukti, what are we doing with the uh, the two curb cuts just specifically? So the front on the Newark Avenue, we are eliminating that curb cut. So there will be no curb cut on Newark Avenue now. And on the Senate place, the curb cut is reduced from 15 feet, six to 10 feet. Okay, great. And that was in conjunction with uh, with the staff planner's uh, recommendation as well that uh, we reduce that to 10 feet. Yeah, that's correct. All right, All right so I think we can move on to the uh, the specific building itself. Yeah, so this, is a, this shows the existing building with partial demolition. So th this is a Senate place. We have a, you know, there's a huge parking at the back and, uh, and some office space, which is at current point, this is not being used. And outside towards at the corner, there's a small cellar, which I've shown it here. And this access to this cellar is only from the outside. So that will that is currently just has some uh, oil tank or some machine there, but it's not being used. So it's basically vacant. Okay, and to clarify, when you say demolition, it's just the interior that's being demolished. Yeah, that's as well. correct. Just interior frame partitions will be demolished. So these two, most of the walls, in fact, there are a lot of openings which are blocked. We'll try to open those up and create a more upgraded facade. So this is a first floor plan where we have provided the main entrance on the Senate place, which is uh, exclusively for the units on the upper floor. And we are also proposing a small commercial in the corner of Senate and Newark Avenue, which is 644 square feet. Uh, towards the north of the property, where we have the existing curb cut, we'll have a garage entrance and we are just providing two parking spaces. Uh, also this, one of them is obviously handicapped parking space. There's an elevator in the building, so all apartments will be handicapped. Um, and at the back of this garage, we have a trash room and a bike parking and a storage space for the residential units. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay, and Mukti, just to confirm while you're on this sheet, the residential and the commercial entrances are completely separated, correct? That's correct. So commercial entrances to on the Newark Avenue and residential on the Senate place. 
Okay, um, and that's and that seller that, uh, that that you mentioned before that's existing. What what would that be for? So this seller will be exclusively used for commercial space. We don't know what the end use of the commercial space will be. So if it's cafe or it depends on how much uh, usage it has, but it's only basically storage or a garbage room for the commercial space depends on the use. <laughs> okay, but to clarify, it would be in that whatever the use ends up being, it would be permitted or else we would have to go to the zoning board of adjustment, obviously. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. All right. So these are the floor plans from second to fifth floor. All the plans are similar. Um, the reason I have two different plans is because of the profile of the building changes a little bit, but the, um, so both the units on each floor are two bedroom, one and a half bath. And the net area of these units is approximately uh, 800, 800 to 800, uh, sorry, 700 to 835 square feet. Right. And they're all the same layouts, correct? All the same layouts with one and a half bath, washer, dryer, center light -like conditioning. Um, yeah. All right, and just before we move on, one one other question. You might have mentioned this, and I apologize if you did, mm -hmm. but all of this entire building, including each unit, are all ADA compliant and accessible. That's correct. That's what is requirement of the code, and all the units are, have, uh, are ADA compliant. Okay, great. All right, so you can take us to the roof. So this is the roof where we have provided a common rooftop deck as a recreation space for the residential units only. And plus we have provided additional planter boxes all on the Senate place uh, and at the corner of uh, Senate and Newark and towards the back as well. This rooftop deck also is recessed or set back uh, from the front property or the front parapet. So we'll have a railing at the back. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's a little excess of bulk yard, but coverage which required us 20 percent if we had 27 percent but that is one of the reason is because the lot size is small and this is the minimum requirement and the building code with the two staircases because of the common rooftop deck the elevator elevator machine room and the compressors and a very small elevator lobby okay and to confirm all, all of those mechanicals and the two means of uh, stair egress and the elevator and the elevator lobby they're all required components to uh, to have an ADA compliant, and really a building code compliant roof deck area. That's correct. Okay. All right. This, this particular this is just a schema, like a very basic elevation of the existing facade, where it just shows some block windows, some portion is masonry. This is a garage entrance on Senate Place, and this is also some opening, which is not. Uh, garage opening at this point, but there's a curb cut and there's an opening here on the Newark Avenue also. And so this particular building, like if you look on the photographs, so there are multifamily or high rise buildings, or five or six story buildings on all the sides. So this particular building is a seven story, this is a six story, the Skanko loft at the back. Okay, and while, while you go back to, yeah, go, you can go back to the elevations, that's okay. And mm -hmm. in, your, in your opinion, I, I was, you, you just went to the materials board, so I was just gonna ask you to talk about the materials a little bit that you chose. Yeah, so, uh, so materials, what we have chosen here um, is a red brick and the gray panel system. So it is use of more, both traditional and modern at the same time. And it is con inconsistent with what is there in the neighboring building. So this building is all masonry. This one is masonry with a panel system, lighter tone of panel system. We have given a light, little darker tone. And first row with the you know, uh, stone cladding. And this is a facade on the Senate place uh, with the main entrance to the building. Um, this is a garage entrance and the front commercial space. And again, the materials are, are the same materials that you showed. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Okay. So this is the back of the facade, um, which is which we have a setback of four feet, six inches. Um, again, these materials are similar in the sense if this is, this will be a vinyl siding, but the tone will be very similar to what we have used on the, on the corner 
over here with the panel system. And this is an east elevation where we are adjacent to the other masonry structure, and we have a setback of three feet one from there. So we could provide some windows. Also, we have added, even though we have a set, um, sorry, the variance for the for the bulkyard, but we have shown the site line diagram to indicate that this particular bulkhead won't be visible from the from the other opposite side of the street. And Mukti, to clarify, that's because we are um, requesting relief for our bulkhead setback of not being uh, nine point, I believe it's nine point seven five feet, where we're at five point five feet. So this is to illustrate. If you could just repeat the, what this what this illustrates. The same thing, like the bulkhead. Uh, setback required is 9.5 feet, and we have six feet over here. Uh, so this sightline diagram is basically indicates that it's not visible from the corner of the street. So even though the street is 15 feet wide, there's some railing here. So you know, obviously, we had just put a figure there to indicate that this is not visible. Also, just want to point out that if you look at the roof plan, um, so we have enough setback from the Novak Avenue that is 24 feet is because the way we have planned this building only from the Senate place, not just because the entrance is on Senate place, you know, we have shown both the setbacks that this is little less than nine feet. <coughs> okay. And just to clarify from Newark Avenue, we, we do meet the setback and do not require. Yeah, that's correct. So again, the same setback is required on Newark Avenue itself, which is nine feet, eight or 10 inches, I believe. And we do compare, we have 24 feet from Newark Avenue. Okay, and the only reason that we're required to set it back from Senate Place is because this is a corner lot, and we are again on. Uh, it's just a second frontage. That's that's why we that's have that good. requirement. Yeah. Okay. All right. I okay. Think that pretty much concludes my testimony. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, okay. Mukti, thank you. Uh, anybody? Any questions? I don't have any actually. Anybody else? No. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bajaj, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you like to open it to the public to Mukti before I proceed to Ed or, or I'll leave that uh, up to you? No, let's go to Ed and then uh, if we need to bring anybody up, we'll bring him back up. Okay, absolutely. All right, Mukti, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so Ed, are you available? You should be on. Yes, I'm, I'm on and I recognize that I have been sworn already and I'm still under oath. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. And Ed, just to clarify, uh, in addition to uh, obviously being part of the project team, you, you did have a chance to, uh, to visit the site, correct? And you are familiar with the site? Yeah. Yes, we had uh, actually, we had staff to visiting the site. We had some, uh, we had some um, uh, photos we, do, we took from, from the, uh, the street and uh, I've been able to review them as well. Okay, right, thank you. So Ed, I, I guess uh, in the interest of, of getting all of your testimony across, why don't you start by explaining what is there now complementary to what Mukti testified to, what we're proposing, and then you can go through the uh, the justifications for the, the minor relief that we're seeking. Right, I'll just hit that briefly because I think that uh, Mukti did a very good job of explaining it, but I just wanted to mention that what's there today, it's a, it's a pre-existing 30 foot wide by 87 foot deep lot. It's at the corner of Senate and Newark Avenue. Uh, it's the western edge of the Newark Avenue um, in the neighborhood commercial district. And what's there today is an existing kind of heavy commercial industrial type of, of use. It's a non-conforming use. It's a non-conforming building. It's not consistent with the intent of, this, of the zone plan. Um, and I think it's important to point that out because what is being proposed is exactly consistent with what the neighborhood commercial district is looking for. It's a very attractive building. It's mixed use residential and commercial on the ground floor. And I think that the design is, is very consistent with, uh, the, with the surrounding area. It's a good blend of the red brick, which reflects some of the older industrial structures across Senate Place, but it also reflects some of the newer, newer architecture that you see a little bit further to the north. And then there's a few newer buildings on Newark Avenue, a little bit to the uh, east, that have the similar types of uh, Material, so I think it's a good blend, a good transition uh, into Newark Avenue as you prog progress up to the neighborhood commercial district. Um, I also want to point out that the building immediately next door is an older industrial structure. 
It is a through lot that goes through from the neighborhood commercial to the R1 district. And also it wraps around the back of the lot. So on the, on the, the Eastern side, you have this two-story industrial structure and behind it, you have a, a, a separate lot, but it's owned by the same uh, company that owns the uh, industrial structure and it's used in conjunction with it. There's a ramp that goes down into the building immediately adjacent to the proposed structure. And then there's another ramp that goes up as a loading dock and there's parking. So I think what you'll find is that the, those, that property will probably be developed uh, consistent with the neighborhood commercial district. And so our proposed building and our existing lot is really remote from any R1 uses that are on the other street uh, behind us. Um, the, I'll just jump right into the variances now and the proofs. Uh, we have a rear yard variance of four and a half feet versus 15. That's partly a hardship. The lot is only 85, 87 feet deep, I believe it is. If this were a conforming lot, we would be able to, to meet the, the rear setback. Uh, so we have that little bit of uh, hardship, I would, I would call it. But also I think you could do this as a C2 variance where the benefits would outweigh the, the detriments significantly. You know, we have a building that's reduced that's non-conforming, a structure that's non-conforming, and it's going to be replaced by something that really promotes the intent and purpose of the zone plan. And um, so I think you could look at it from the C2 benefits that way the detriment argument as well. On the rooftop, there is the, both the issue of the coverage and as well as the setbacks. The setback variance really is also could be looked at as a hardship because it is a corner lot. We comply with the setback requirement for the bulkheads from the front property line, but we have a secondary frontage. So that makes it more difficult to comply on that side because the lot is 30 feet wide, but, but you can't uh, position the, uh, the bulkheads any further to the east than we already have. So there is a, a, a practical difficulties in meeting the intent, in meeting the, the strict enforcement of that requirement. Although I think we meet the intent because we have moved it as far to the east as we could. And as, as uh, the architect has pointed out, there, with the, between the parapet and how the building is designed, the, uh, the bulkhead will be invisible, invisible from the street. The roof coverage is, is also a hardship in, in that um, this is, a, a lot that's conforming in terms of area, but it's still a relatively small uh, property. So when you have to put up there the, the bulkhead for the elevator, you need two means of egress for the fire safety standards, um, and you need to have uh, the, um, the lobby area for stepping off the elevator to be protection from the, the weather. And to make this site more uh, ADA compliant, it's virtually impossible to meet the, uh, the coverage requirement. It's invisible from the street. I don't think it's gonna have any, any detriment to the public good or to general welfare. And I think the benefits really outweigh the detriments as I was describing before. The last variance to address is really the curb cut. And in this case, there are two curb cuts, one on Long Newark Avenue, which is specifically prohibited at any rate at this point in time. And that's gonna be completely removed. There's gonna be a tree put there instead. And that's gonna be where the commercial uh, space will be accessed from. And the space on Senate Place is really a secondary, uh, you know, it's a secondary street. So I don't see there's any negative impact there uh, in putting the driveway cut in that location because it already exists and it's being significantly reduced. Um, there will be an increase in, in curb along there that'll help uh, provide for more efficient curbside parking. So I think that's a benefit from that pers perspective. And the other thing is that, although there are only two spaces and re the requirement is that there be five for a curb cut, one of the spaces is gonna be a handicapped space. This building is completely handicapped, uh, adaptable, ADA compliant. And therefore, if there is a, a handicapped individual, they'll be able to use that space on a priority basis and that, that will free up, again, you, rather than having a handicapped space being on a permit basis from the city, that can be in, interior to the building, providing more uh, publicly accessible space that will be open to the, the general community and the, and the neighbors. So I think that's a better approach to design and being able to provide that handicapped space on site. So I, I think 
that's, I think it's clear from how this building uh, is being designed and, and how it's proposed that the, the benefits will substantially outweigh the detriments in, in replacing this non-conforming use and structure. No substantial detriment to the public good or general welfare. Uh, the building is actually promotes the, the, in, the intent and purpose of the NC zoning district. So I think that uh, this, the variances can be granted either through the C1 criteria because of the undersized lot and the corner location or through the C2 criteria where the benefits substantially outweigh any detriment. Thanks, Ed. I just have two follow-up questions uh, and, and, and that's really it. But uh, for the C2, which I know you're using, do you mind just touching on a couple of the specific purposes that you feel are advanced? Well, yeah, I mean, in addition to, the, to promoting the intent and purpose of the zone plan, we looked at the purposes of the act. You know, to, uh, Subparagraph 2A talks about encouraging municipal action to guide the appropriate use and development of, of the property. So, you know, clearly, since we're promoting the intent and purpose of the zone plan, uh, we are guiding the appropriate use of the development, and, and that in itself will promote the public health, safety, and general welfare. The building is code compliant uh, in, that, in the regard from ADA accessibility in terms of meeting all fire codes and all that, all those sort of uh, codes and standards. So. 2A is certainly met. The building also promotes the establishment of appropriate population densities. The intent of the MC district is to have mixed uses and the current building doesn't have any, any residential whatsoever. Um, this building will have a compliant residential land uses above the ground floor commercial. So that promotes a, a um, appropriate population density. The, the property provides sufficient space in an appropriate location. Again, it's a mixed use commercial residential building in a zone that permits it. So that's clearly an appropriate location. And the property does have sufficient space to uh, accommodate the proposed uses. Um, I think from promoting a desirable visual environment, that, that really needs no exp explanation when you look at the before and after pictures, really. And also, I think in terms of subparagraph 2J, uh, the, this project promotes the conservation of energy resources. Um, simply by the fact that we're preserving the existing building, we're not going to be adding to any uh, landfill issues. Um, it also prevents urban sprawl and degradation of the environment through improper use of the land. Clearly, this is a proper use of the land. Um, and I, therefore, I think that we meet numerous, numer numerous purposes of the act as well. Thank you. And Ed, last question for you as well. Just taking a look at that radius map uh, down on the bottom left corner that Mukti's got put up. Uh, just given the the intersection of the multiple zones, I, I just if you could put on the record, is is it your opinion as a planner that given the the multi this this property's location relative to really all the all the colors that are going on on that map, that this is an appropriate development for this site? Well, yes, yeah, clearly. I mean, it's a mixed use use uh, in a in a mixed use zone. It's approximate to the R3 zone, which is multifamily. This is also multifamily. Uh, there's a there's a pedestrian bridge that crosses between the two districts. It's proximate to Journal Square, uh, and as as some of the photographs that that the architect had shown before, there are other multifamily and newer multifamily developments really nearby this. So it, it really it kind of really fits in with the ongoing redevelopment of this area. Thank you, I, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Council. Um, yeah, I have no questions for Ed. As usual, he's uh, <laughs> been pretty descriptive. Um, anybody, any questions? Anything? Okay, thank you, Council. Anything else from you? Yeah, I would just uh, just ask in, uh, in in closing that uh, you please uh, appreciate everything that we've presented tonight, and uh, and I would ask respectfully that you approve this application for a preliminary and final major site plan, uh, along with the variances that have been enumerated and presented. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, all right, so at this time we'll open it up for public. Uh, if anybody out there wants to comment, please raise your hand. If you are calling in, please press star nine to raise your hand. Anybody from public? Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Erica, do you have anything to add? Uh, so I provided a staff report dated November 23rd 
uh, to council. Uh, I just want you to know if you've reviewed it and if you've agreed to the standard conditions outlined in that report. Yes, I have, and thank you very much. We we absolutely accept those. Okay, thank you. I have no further comments, and staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve case P two zero dash one zero seven as presented to the board tonight. Second. Okay. We have a motion made and seconded for approval. Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Allen. I mean Horton. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Great addition to the community. Excellent. And uh, Chairman Linkson. Yeah, it's uh, again nice design from Ms. Bajaj. Um, and Mr. Colling, as, as always, uh, you know, nailed his points home. Uh, I think the variances are well within reason. So I'm an aye. All right. Uh, motion carries all in favor. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank Have you. a great evening. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, all right. If we could, real quick, let's bring up uh, Stephen Joseph. We are going to be carrying uh, case P19 171 for 16 to 20 Nevin Street. I don't see him. Maybe he left. I don't know. Is Cameron still on? Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Um, he confirmed via email to agree to carry. Okay. With, with preservation of notice. Okay, so uh, we're gonna carry to December eighth for case P one nine dash one seven one for sixteen to twenty Devon Street. Uh, we have Ashley Brin with her hand up. Uh, I don't think she has anything else tonight. No, because it was just Stephen Joseph's. Maybe that's a leftover. Okay. No, it just went up. Do we want to uh, bring the brain up real quick? Yeah, we should see what, what she would like. Hi, yeah, it's it intentional hand raising. Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we have some issues we would like to bring on the record for case P20-025. Okay, um, should we wait until we speak to Jean? Yeah, yeah we, we should uh, call the case first. We can leave Miss Breen on the screen and let's, are we going to call the case, Chairman? What are we doing? Uh, uh, we are, I'm going to bring Jean up. I'll call the case and we'll bring Jean up and uh, we'll have a conversation real quick. Yeah. Well, let's, on the call, screen, so. <laughs> let's call case P20-025 uh, is a preliminary final major site plan with C variances for 20 carbon place. Gene, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I don't know if you heard we're losing uh, I did. Mr. Chair Gonzalez very soon. Uh, we I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion if you, if you would hear me out. Uh, I know you're short for time. We are. We have to get resolutions memorialized as well tonight. Yeah. And I know that uh, one of the things, oh, th th this is actually two applications. One is a subdivision tied to a site plan application. What I was going to suggest to you is since the subdivision application is really short, it's one person with a very clear division of property, uh, that you hear the subdivision and vote on it and we'll take the site plan application next time around with another vote. But we have one case number. I don't know why that's the case, but the, the notice was for a subdivision and a site plan approval. Um, and there was two applications filed. Yeah, I, I, I have it all lumped under one case number. Though, Jane. Okay, I guess it was just the way it was filed. But I do have two general development applications, but it's lumped under. Yeah, I, I have no idea what, how the enumeration occurred, but. There's a subdivision application and there's a site plan application. Well, if if that's the case, they were sunshined improperly also. On they our... were sunshined. Uh, well, I, I, the notice went out, the public notice went out properly. The publication You're... was properly done because it, it mentioned both. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that planning sunshine ah. is improper on our on our agenda. Um, Erica, which case number are we open to now? 
the uh, the P two zero dash zero two five. Is that the site plan or is that the subdivision? That's Everything the that I have that was filed that was, um, the site plan. was have these two together. I don't even. I'm not sure if they're even separate on our intake log. But I believe the way that our office filed it was as one. Okay. I did file it. Um, I didn't do the intake, but I believe that's the way it was given to me. Okay, Gina, I I feel like I'm going to disappoint you here tonight, but um, I think we're going to have to get that worked out as well. If uh, here's my problem. Here's my problem. My problem is that I have a client that for various reasons needs to start this, at least start it today. Uh, doesn't have to finish it today and can just do the engineering today. If you want to do the engineering portion of the site plan and then do the subdivision later, later, that's fine. I mean, technically we already called the application. It is open on record right now. No, right. So if that's what you're looking for, I think we've satisfied that at least. <clears throat> we can you mean by your, calling it? Yeah, we can confirm your notice. And um, apparently uh, we do have an objector. Uh, so, you know, we are gonna have to work out, work out an objection. Um, so council or uh, chairman for the record, let's, let's address the notice issue as best we can. Uh, Mr. Polino, I see the notice. The notice indicates that there is a subdivision, but I only have a notice, one notice for both the subdivision and the site plan. There were not two separate notices, correct? No, there was one notice. Right. Okay. I have no issue with that. Uh, I find that, you know, that's proper. I don't have an issue with that. I think it clearly identifies what the application is. So with respect to the notice, I find it to be an order chairman. And I think that as a result, the jurisdiction is proper before the board. With respect to the issue of sunshine, chairman, I have everything in, in the portal as far as the subdivision the site plan, the topo plans, affidavits of ownership. So I'm not clear. I guess, yes, the subdivision application was filed, as was a site plan application, but it's common practice to file a subdivision and site plan as one application simultaneously. There's nothing that requires the subdivision to be filed separately from the site plan. Occasionally we bifurcate applications and, and really the purpose of that is to address some of the easier items and to potentially save on, on the cost of the plan preparation itself. So uh, that's, that's where I'm at on this chairman and, and council. So, I, I think as far as procedurally goes, we're able to proceed and I have no issue. Okay. Council okay. Breen, I think we should have her place her appearance on the record, who she represents. It sounded like she was objecting in part to the application, but I think we should hear from her at least and, and see if we can identify some issues. So. Chairman, I'll, I'll defer to you. Sure. No, that's that's exactly what I want to do. Ms. Breen, are you there? You're muted. There you are. You're... She's muted. Ms. Breen, you're muted. I'm sorry. My internet keeps kicking me out, so I'm going between my two devices. Um, <laughs> Did you want me to, to put our, our, our concerns on the record? Yeah. I'd like you to identify who you represent, Council. And then, yes, and Council, your, your internet does seem to be cutting in and out, but we'll try to work through it. Uh 
I might be able to help. I did receive a phone Seems call. Seems to be good, but let's see, Jean. I'm sorry. So we represent the adjoining property owner, 49 Fisk LLC. We put the neighbor on notice about a building that was encroaching on our property. And we know it's not an issue for this board, but we wanted to make sure it was on the record. So we preserved our rights with respect to the encroachment. We did not receive the notice and did not have the opportunity to review the survey, which appears to be in conflict in a material way with our survey. So we think it's appropriate for the board to carry the application so we have a chance to review the plans. If I could respond to that, if I can, Council. Sure, absolutely. I did receive a call from Don Pepe from the same office as Ashley uh, during the course of this hearing while other matters were being heard. He told me of the two issues, which one was the encroachment and the, and the other is, it was the uh, lack of notice. The notice, the notice is the notice. I mean, we were given a notice uh, listing from the city. Uh, there was publication, there was a mailing and uh, I assume that he was part of it. We hear this often from people that say they didn't receive something. I don't know whether he did or not. The second issue as to the encroachment, that's really not your issue, but even were you to consider it, the building that encroaches upon the property is being demolished as part of this application. So that issue is moot. It goes away once the building is gone and we could settle the, the line issues, the lot line issues, uh, separately from the planning board's issues uh, of, of zoning. Uh, so I don't think either of those, those objections would inhibit your hearing testimony on the site plan or the subdivision. That's what I, that's my argument. Okay. Uh, Ms. Breen, do you have any concern with that testimony? Um, our position remains the same. Okay. So, Ms. Breen, what is the property address for you? It's 49 Fisk Street. And your client is 49 Frisk Property Owners, LLC? Correct. Okay. So, uh, I do have them on the list. I have a certified mail receipt that it went out to them. So, uh, that answers that. I will note for purposes of the record that your client apparently is registered with the city at an address in New York. And perhaps that has caused uh, the delay in them receiving it. I don't know. But either way, obviously, as we all know, the requirement is that the notice goes out in conformance with the list. And uh, that's what's happened here this evening. Obviously, you guys are aware of the proceedings, so uh, we can move forward in that regard and we'll preserve your, your position for the record. And Council uh, Green, your position is that the applicant's building encroaches onto your property? I believe so, yes. Okay. And Mr. Polino, it's your uh, position that that building is being demolished as part of this application, even if it does encroach. Exactly. So chairman, I, I think from a procedural and jurisdictional point of view, we can proceed. Council's objections are noted for the record and uh, preserved for, for their purposes. And I am sure that that issue will, will get addressed as the process plays itself out. So with that, Chairman, I do note the time is now quarter to 10. <laughs> yeah. And we do have to memorialize those resolutions. So we do. Uh, so Council. Uh, I, 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 I appreciate the uh, Chairman uh, calling the, the matter. Uh, I think we, because of your time constraints, I, I think you've gone about as far as you can go here. I, I, I don't want, I know what your issues are and I know what you need to do before the end of, you're losing your quorum. So I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna raise a whole of a little here. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Um, I, I hope, you know, us at least calling this helps your client out. Um, so, uh, could I get a motion to carry case P20-0250 20 Carbon Place 
uh, to a date certain December 8th with preservation of notice uh, with testimony taken. Sure, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to uh, carry uh, case P20-025-20 uh, carbon place to a date certain of 12-8-2020 uh, uh, with preservation of notice okay. and testimony taken. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second. Erica, could we have a roll call please for Jean? Yes, Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Gangadin. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Horton. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. Your motion carries all in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank, thank you. you Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Thank okay, you. let's move on Excuse to me, memorialization Council. of resolutions, please. Sure, Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, uh, make a motion to memorialize the following resolutions. There are six and then one uh, actual uh, correction. So I'll start with one applicant 241 Third Street Realty LLC for minor site plan approval address at 241 Third Street. Block 11109, lot five. Case number on that is P20 088. Second resolution is applicant Sims Development LLC for minor subdivision with C variances. Address is 122 Terrace Avenue, block 2503, lot five. Case number P20 030. Uh, the third resolution is uh, recommending approval and adoption to City Council uh, the proposed amendments to the Jersey City Land Development Ordinance. Chapter 345, Article 3, Traffic and Visual Impact Assessment. Fourth resolution is applicant Randy Levitt, uh, Capital 1NA, for minor site plan approval, address, two, uh, I'm sorry, 921 Bergen Avenue, Block 12104, Lot 2, case number P20-075. Um, number five is applicant 575, Pavonia LLC, for preliminary and final major site plan man, uh, amendment approval, the design waiver and a C deviation address at 532 Summit Avenue, block 9606, lot 2901, formally 29, uh, 32-35, case number P20-113 on that one. And the last resolution is applicant Hearts Mountain Industries Incorporated for administrative amendment approval. Address is at 2 Journal Square, block 9403, lot 15. Um, in parentheses C0002 um, and uh, close parentheses and case number on that is P20-063. I do have uh, a resolution for correction to be made on the record. Uh, the following resolution is for case P19-190 for minor subdivision and site plan at 252 Webster Avenue. The case was heard uh, at the September 8th, 2020 virtual planning board meeting under the incorrect case number of P19-090. Uh, the resolution will be memorialized under the correct case number, which was assigned to this property at the point of original filing with the Division of City Planning in 2019. This is resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City, applicant 252 Webster Avenue, LLC, for minor subdivision and site plan. Address is 252 Webster Avenue, block 2306, lot 14, Case number P19-190. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please, Erica? Yes, Vice Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Chairman, uh, I mean, not Chairman, Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner <laughs> Aye. Commissioner Horton. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Aye. <laughs> Jeffrey, you almost got it. Almost, <laughs> Jeffrey. I think I'll be set up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, executive session. No, We're but Chairman, if I may, can we just, we have a meeting on the 8th. Yes. And what is the date of the second meeting in December? Is it that 22nd? No. So we do not have an additional meeting scheduled for December. Okay. Um, we could do a special meeting if necessary. But I don't think that's necessary. What do you say? I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> and, um, we have had a number of special meetings. I feel like we do this every week now. We do. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's. <laughs> that's why I, I, I have have. as chairman. <laughs> we, we can discuss this at a later date. Yeah. <laughs> um, We'll see how it goes on the eight. Uh, could I have a motion for adjournment then? 
Mr. Charlie, to make a motion to adjourn. Second. And motion made and seconded. Thank you, guys. We're adjourned. Orlando. Thanks, thanks guys. I'm sorry about uh, having to uh, pop out at 10. I was hoping that after the... Uh, no, Erica thank sent, you. Uh, after, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. After Erica, you sent that, uh, uh, you know, addendum on the corrected agenda. I figured we'd be able to get out, but um, we didn't. So I really apologize, but I'm hoping you guys um, are okay with it. No yeah. worries. Apologize. No worries. Thank you. Any right, Thanksgiving, guys. Thanks. Have a good Thanksgiving, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. You too.